Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Clark Art Institute. My name is Larry Smallwood, the Deputy Director. I'm speaking today on behalf of Olivier Millet, our Hardyman Director. Uh, Olivier sends his deepest regrets that he can't be here in person to express his pride in seeing the symposium come to fruition. I have two small operational notes this morning. If you could please silence your cell phones and note the four exits to your left, right, and behind. Thank you. It's an honor for us to host today's event, which has been organized by Marco Antonio Flores, a student in the Williams Graduate Program in the History of Art, and Andine Chavoya, a professor of art at Williams College. Uh, in the 1970s, when the Clark and Williams collaborated in establishing a graduate program in the history of art, it was primarily with the intention of supporting new voices and ideas in art history. Today, a symposium like this one realizes the goals of this collaboration, allowing us to engage and support the necessary evolution of art history and museum practice. As all of you know, On Dean, as a scholar, has been a critical and formative voice in establishing the study of Latina, Latino visual culture in the United States. Many of our graduate students come to work with him and we're very fortunate to have him here as a colleague. As a student in our program, we're certain that Marco will be a rising important voice in the next generation of scholars. This year, with the sponsorship of the Clark, Marco curated a significant exhibition at Mass MoCA entitled Rafa Sparza Staring at the Sun, an installation of adobe brick and sunny paintings that transforms the white cube of the museum's most conservative gallery and realizes, as they describe it, the browning of the museum walls and collections. We're thrilled to be involved in exhibitions with such power. Across the country, organizations like the Clark are examining the lack of diversity that has been institutionalized in so many museums and collections. By supporting events such as these, we can perhaps begin to move the needle and to recognize that art history is composed of divergent and intersecting voices and histories, all of which must be heard, seen, and read. Indeed, this is the first symposium dedicated to US Latinx art at the Clark, and we hope it will be, beginning, be the beginning of conversations both national and international. So thank you to Marco and to Andine for bringing these speakers, ideas, and conversations here today. And with that, will you please help me welcome Professor Andine Chavoy, who will introduce the first panel. Good morning, buenos dias, and welcome. Thank you for being with us all here this morning. A very special thank you to the Clark Art Institute for hosting us. Um, this is definitely the first, and as Larry mentioned, hopefully not the last uh, event ever convened at the Clark focused on Latinx art. And a very special thank you to Mark Gottlieb, director of the graduate program, for making this possible. And to Marco Antonio Flores for the vision and ganas, which might, it's hard to translate ganas, but something like desire, right? For the vision and desire to bring us all together. Um, thank you to um, friends and colleagues from the art department and other departments and programs across, across campus and to our Williams students for being here this morning. It's a super busy time uh, at the end of the semester. Um, so sh the fact that you're sharing part of your morning with us means a tremendous amount. And we also have students here from Washington University in St. Louis, students from California, and graduate students visiting from Washington, D.C., as well as friends and colleagues who have traveled from places like New Haven and New York City. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the first panel, and then the speakers will come up uh, one by one, and then they'll be, um, we'll ask them all to come and, uh, afterwards and, and sit on the stage, and there'll be a, a Q&A, uh, a moderated Q&A as well. Our first panel brings together three of my favorite curators, and I can also say like three of my favorite people in the whole world, um, and art world superstars, each of, who, each of whom have pioneered new directions and forged new paths in the museum world. Collectively, they are our powerhouse, who have rewritten the field of American art and art history and opened up pathways that have, had long been closed to Latinx cultural workers and artists. Our first speaker will be Rocio Aranda Alvarado, who is an art historian and program officer for the Ford Foundation, working on the creativity and free expression team. Her primary focus is on the visual cultural production of folks of color with a special interest in Latinxes. 
She is a former curator of El Museo del Barrio, where she organized numerous exhibitions from 2019 to 2017, including Antonio Lopez, Future Funk Fashion, a show that I think about all the time, and Presente, The Young Lords in New York, and La Biennal, El Museo's Biennial um, for Emerging Artists. Prior to El Museo, she was curator at the Jersey City Museum. And her talk this morning is titled, They're Coming to America, the Pre-Latinx Generation. The second speaker is Rita Gonzalez, the Terry and Michael Smoke Curator and Department Head of Contemporary Art at LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where she has curated numerous exhibitions, including Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement, Osco Elite of the Obscure, Lost Lines, Contemporary Art from the Collection, and Agnes Varda, Rest in Peace. That wasn't the title of the show, but um, Agnes Varda, Rest in Power. That wasn't the title of the show either, but Agnes Varda in California Land and also a universal history of infamy, among other exhibitions and programs. She was a curatorial advisor for Prospect 3 New Orleans and part of the curatorial team for the cur first Current LA Biennial in 2016 and very recently for the 2018 Guangzhou Biennial. The title of her talk is Basements, Portals, Adobe, Latinx Artists Reconceiving Institutional Exhibitionary Frameworks. Pilar Tompkins Rivas uh, will be our third speaker. Pilar is a director of the Vincent Price Art Museum, or VPAM, at East Los Angeles College. Specializing in US, Latino, and Latin American contemporary art, she's organized dozens of exhibitions throughout the United States, Colombia, Egypt, France, and Mexico. Curatorial projects include Home, So Different, So Appealing, and A Universal History of Infamy at LACMA, LAX Chicano at, LAC at LACMA, The Fowler, and the Autry National Center, and Vexing Female Voices from East LA Punk at the Claremont Museum of Art. At VPAM, she has organized Regeneración, Three Generations of Revolutionary Ideology, Tastemakers and Earthshakers, Notes from Los Angeles Youth Culture, and Decolonial Atlas, Strategies in Contemporary Art of the Americas. This exhibition, Decolonial Atlas, is currently on view at Union College in Schenectady, nearby Schenectady, New York, at the Mandeville Gallery through June 16th, and I highly recommend uh, that you see that show. Um, the title of Pilar's talk is From the Inside Out, Museum Strategies for Latinx Art. Julia Bryan Wilson will serve as respondent and moderator following the three presentations. Julia Bryan Wilson is a Doris and Clarence Mallow Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art at UC Berkeley. This year, she's been serving as a Robert Sterling Clark Visiting Professor at Williams, which has been incredible for our students and our community to have you here. She's adjunct curator at the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, and her most recent book, Fray, Art, and Textile Politics, won the, won the Frank Jewett Mather, among many other prizes. She is also a 2019 Guggenheim Fellow. Please help me in welcoming our astounding panel and, uh, and to welcome Rocio Aranda Alvarado to the stage, please. Thank you, Yondine, for the generous introduction. I just want to say I'm honored to be on this panel with these other two women who are goddesses to me. Um, and to thank you to uh, Marco for organizing this. It's so great to have us all together at the same time to talk about our work, and to the Clark for hosting us, and to Corey, our lovely tech person. I'm going to set my timer. In hoping to establish a history of U US Latinx art, I often wonder, how do we begin the story? Which are the artists that can be included? Which artists would prefer not to be included in such a project or discussed as part of a history of Latinx art? Within this history, where does Latin America end and the US begin? As Carmen Ramos has described in her essay on the work of Luis Jimenez, US Latinx artists were inspired and influenced in much the same way as their Anglo counterparts. That is, to discuss their history and work separately is inaccurate. The triumph of American painting, as Irving Sandler called it, marked the elevation of abstraction to its glorified pinnacle within the history of art of the United States. It also pointed to its framing in the service of political rhetoric. 
as a response to regionalism, abstraction represented a new freedom for a younger generation, some of whom trained with the Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros. Olga Albizu and Carmen Herrera became two of the most important artists working in an abstract language in New York during this time period. And still, we have yet to see their works widely included in permanent collection installations or exhibitions that explore this moment from American art history. Also important to address and related to my presentation is the usefulness or uselessness of the term Latinx. Recently, the Perez Art Museum Miami and the Art Center of South Florida organized a two-day event titled Latinx Art Sessions. Among the materials published by the Art Center of South Florida was the following definition of Latinx. Latinx was initially introduced to subvert the gender binary of the Spanish language as an alternative to the term Latino, Latina, Latin ampersand. Within the visual arts, Latinx reconsiders artists of Latin American descent whose practice is informed by a lived U.S. experience. This term encompasses a heterogeneous group of artists who often portray notions of multilingualism, creolization, and migration, and whose work illustrates shifting identities rooted in multiple cultural locations. I prefer not to label any person or artist as Latinx. Specificity is always better. As Deborah Cullen, my esteemed colleague, always said, to say a Ponce-born, Chicago-based artist will always be better than any generalization. It is only when we're attempting to speak about a group of us all together that it seems more convenient to use a term like Latino, Latina, Latinx. But most people will never embrace this way of generalizing themselves into any group. We have to acknowledge that it creates other kinds of invisibilities around race, class, gender, and sexuality. Most artists of a certain generation prefer not to even be referred to as Hispanic or Latino, Latina at all. It's also important to acknowledge the fact that the historical naming of our group, particularly by the state and the confusion surrounding it, is purposeful. Think of all the different ways we're described for the various boxes that we have to check on forms, both official and not. As Adriana Zavala has asked, is the category of Latinx art meaningful? Should an artist who identifies as Chicano, Chicana, or Mexican American, or post Chicano, Chicana, be categorized as Latino, Latina? Given all this, the question becomes, can we create a history of US Latinx art and still include artists who have never and would never use these terms? Until the history of Latinx artists is fused with a general US art history, I feel we still need to acknowledge the work that has been done by generations of artists working in this country and its relationship to the larger cultural context in which it is made. I'm interested particularly in the period between 1960 and 1980 when artists from all over the Americas began to arrive in New York, in part as a result of the triumph of American painting. As a result of the birth of this powerful and iconic artistic movement, a wave of artists coming to New York would forever change not only their own careers, but the tenor of the history of art in the city. In addition to this, exhibitions like Magnet New York at the America's Society and the Museum of Modern Art's Information Exhibition and the Guggenheim Fellowships all work to continue a permanent flow of artists from south to north. Some came New York to, to New York to study in an art school, apprentice with an artist, or begin a new stage of work in their career. Of the artists who remained in New York or the United States, do they become part of the history of Latinx art, even if they would never have used the terms Hispanic, Latino, or Latina? Certainly, they haven't become part of the history of American art. Thinking on this field of art history, I think we're faced with many of these kinds of questions about the ways in which we can or cannot describe the work through this narrative. And what about artists living and working in Puerto Rico? I'm quite certain that none of them would like to be referred to as Latinx artists. Coming back to our chronology and the movement of important historical figures into and through the United States, we can consider how prepared they were to arrive in this artistic mega, mecca. As Art uh, Carla Stelweg has noted, quote, contrary to the spare knowledge of things Latin American in the United States, Latin American intellectuals had access to plenty of information about cultural and artistic developments in the United States. North American films, books, magazines, and a series of traveling exhibitions organized by the U.S. Information Agency promoted U.S. culture, unquote. That is to say, artists who were arriving here already had far more general knowledge about American culture than their U.S. counterparts knew about any other country at all. 
And now bear with me as I go through a list of artists who came to the magnetic New York City seeking inspiration. Carmen Herrera arrived in New York in 1939 and permanently relocated there in 1950. Olga Albizu arrived in New York in 1948, settling there permanently in 1958. Luis Kamnitzer arrived in 1961 and has remained there since. Anna Mendieta and her sister arrived in Iowa in 1960. Mendieta settled in New York in the late 1970s. Another Cuban exile arriving in 1960 is Luis Cruz Asaceta, who stayed in New York until 1992 when he moves to New Orleans, where he still lives today. Enrique Castro Cid, an artist from Chile, arrived in New York in the early 1960s and settled in Miami in 1980. The Dominican painter Freddy Rodriguez and the Argentine sculptor Liliana Porter both arrived in New York City in 1963 and have remained there ever since. Juan Downey moved from Santiago, Chile to New York in 1965. Fanny Sanin moved from her native Bogota to New York in 1971 and still lives there. Jaime Davidovich arrived in the, early, in the city in the early 1970s and remained there until his recent death. Agustin Fernandez moved to Greenwich Village in 1972 and lived in Manhattan for the rest of his life. Catalina Parra arrived in New York City in 1980 and has remained there until just recently when she moved to Pennsylvania. Two more artists from Chile, Jorge Tacla and Alfredo Yar, arrived in New York in 1981 and 1982 and still live there today. <clears throat> These artists are only part of a long and solid trajectory of artists from the rest of the Americas coming to make a life in New York City. And what about artists of this same generation born in New York? Montañez Ortiz and Juan Sanchez are both born in Brooklyn and still live in the area today. They represent two distinct aesthetic modes of working that could be understood to epitomize two of the major directions that modern American art took throughout the 20th century. Discussing New York as the center that drew all artists, that drew artists from all over the Americas, Louise Kamnitzer noted the following in his essay, Wonder Bread and Spanglish Art. He states, New York values, or international art market values, are derived from an infrastructure that can afford them. This assumption is one more paradigm used in the attempt to achieve cultural unity. As a consequence of the mythical assumption of this paradigm, there is also a periphery within the center, sometimes referred to as the third world within the first world. It encompasses internal colonies, dependent cultures, and emigres from the geographical periphery. As an example of how values are shifted, the use of Wonder Bread as a reference illustrates the flow of pressure between the hegemonic center and the periphery. I think with these statements, Luis is making the first attempts to group, to interpret, and to codify a group of artists that historically would have been described as Hispanic. I'll return to this shortly. In terms of Hispanic, let's look briefly at some early so-called Hispanic exhibitions. From 1983 to 1986, a series of exhibitions of work by Latinx artists was sponsored by Canadian Club and made a tour of various venues across the country, stopping at El Museo del Barrio. In its first two iterations, the exhibition was curated by slides that artists submitted for consideration. The following three exhibitions were curated by professionals with expertise in Hispanic art and culture. People such as Ricardo Pavillosa, Inverna Lacpez, and Susana Torroya Leval. Among the many artists featured in these exhibitions were Humberto Calzada, Freddy Rodriguez, Liliana Porter, Luis Cruz Asaceta, Cesar Martinez, Diane Gamboa, Julio Larraz, Juan Sanchez, Arnaldo Roche Rabel, Fanny Sanin, Carlos Alfonso, Jorge Tacla, and Jesse Trevino. In the last three versions in particular, the list of artists reads like a who's who among Chicanx and Latinx artists of the time. So these exhibitions were a joyous mix of Chicanos from LA, Tejanos and Hispanos from the Southwest, and New Yorkans and Dominican Yorks from the East Coast. They were also mixing clearly distinctive styles and ways of working into a single exhibition, one based specifically around ethnicity but also revealing a commitment to advancing the early study and understanding of this artistic production. 
In these exhibitions, conceptual artists and figurative painters are placed in conversations with artists who are working as visual activists, all in different ways recording the history of Latinxes in the United States. These early exhibitions support an understanding of these artists with very different ways of working as part of a longer trajectory that reaches into the current moment. In this way, we might think of artists with very different ways of working and life experiences, like Luis Cruz Sassita and Liliana Porter, Diane Gamboa and Fanny Sanin, Cesar Martinez and Jorge Tacla, as all part of this earlier generation of artists who have contributed not just to the moment we might call pre-Latinx, but to the history of American art. In support of these ideas, I call to our attention the work of artists and thinkers like Amalia Mesa Baines, Luis Kamnitzer, and Mari Mar Benitez, whose writings have already asserted some of these potential truths. Amalia Mesa Baines has described the entire history of Chicano and Latino art in terms of these same kinds of cross-pollinations. In an essay from 1989 titled Contemporary Chicano and Latino Art, experiences, sensibilities, and intentions, she states, quote, in a further expansion of narrative motifs, figurative work combines with emblems from Latino and Chicano mythology. This mythology is a blend of contemporary urban symbols and the cosmology stemming from ancient times. The paintings of Carlos Almaraz, Roberto Gil de Montes, and Liliana Porter present an ongoing language of ancient and modern emblems. Through this grouping of three artists working in very different aesthetic modes, Amalia creates a paradigm in which the objects of memory are allowed to occupy vastly different visual spaces that still remain relevant to describing the human condition. In the canvases of these artists, objects of all kinds and scales elicit memory and emotional responses. Cool, diminutive, and slick or thick, heavy and tortured, the surfaces of these works reveal similar ways of thinking about how life can be interpreted. Despite the minimalist aesthetic of Porter's work, Amalia sees it as clearly connected to the kind of Baroque excess to which Almanaz's work is interpreted, and to the love of diminutive and carefully selected objects that characterize Gil de Monte's work also. Amalia goes on to discuss Porter's work in more detail, writing, quote, Using another metaphoric language, Liliana Porter's paintings require and elicit a psychological complicity from the viewer. Her mythology is literary, private, and transports the viewer on a journey of objects, fragments, remembrances, and illusion. In the sediment of these works, emblems shift, are dislodged, break away, and reappear in a mythology that is at once the present and the past, where reality and illusion are confounded." Unquote. By using mythology as a category into which numerous kinds of works can be gathered and interpreted, Amalia places artists who perhaps may never embrace terms like Latino, Latina, into conversations around this very experience, bringing her into the fold with artists like Almos Almaraz and Roberto Gil de Montes, Amalia places immigrants from Argentina and Mexico into conversation around a shared understanding of the deeper implications of objects, forms, color, and texture, all in the service of narrative. Her interpretation of what she calls another metaphoric language allows for an acknowledgement of the vastly different visual texts these artists use, but still helps to place them in an art historical conversation that creates meaning for our purposes. In a related way of thinking and writing, Louise Kamnitzer proposes the concept of Spanglish art as a way to interpret transnational, transcultural expression. He notes, Spanglish art is probably the most authentic alternative for the uprooted Latin artist. It is a natural and unaffected expression, representing with fairness the fact that one came from one place and went to another, and it functionally bridges the abyss left by that travel. It is an individualistic solution which allows for release of the tension caused by the clash of two cultures, and it permits the integration of both experiences into one iconography. Luis goes on to list Ana Mendieta, Juan Sanchez, and Alfredo Yar as examples of artists he would place under his rubric of Spanglish art. These three examples also match our ongoing list of artists who were born here or who came to the United States at, at an early age and remained here for the rest of their lives, continuing to make work in an American context and clearly contributing to expressions of an, of an American experience. Like Amalia, 
Luis places artists working in very different styles with deeply different life and immigration experiences in the Spanglish art category. In this way, the work of a Cuban exile, a Brooklyn-born Puerto Rican, and a Chilean immigrant are placed together to create a shared history, a shared participation in the expression of American cultural life. Artists whose lives are based in unique points of origin can be thought of as sharing the experience of the outsider, the lived reality of difference. Exploring their works together, we see the use of the body or the silhouette as a metaphor, for example, in the works of Juan Sanchez and Ana Mendieta. The outline of the body, the outline of the island, body as island, island as body, the body as signifier of nationhood, memory, colonialism, imperialism, and, lo and loss. These metaphorical phrases are deeply resonant in the works of both artists. In a similar vein, the body as a symbol of loss, absence, and disappearance is central to the works of both Yar and Mendieta. Slow and lengthy disappearance, a permanent loss, is recorded by both artists. Disappearance as a result of political violence, invisibility, and the legacies of colonialism becomes another key trope, exploited by artists with very different life experiences and immigration stories. The silhouette of Puerto Rico, the blurry outline of the body, the portrait used to identify the missing, these all become key signifiers of a search for healing across the hemisphere. Turning to another essay, as a similar example, Mari Mar Benitez discusses the relationship between the works of Pepón Osorio and Rafael Montañez Ortiz. In comparing Osorio's La Cama from 1987 in the collection of El Museo del Barrio with Montañez Ortiz's archaeological find number three from the Museum of Modern Arts collection, she notes that Osorio is, quote, Osorio's work is, quote, a celebration of life that points to, new, to a new image of the ghetto in contrast with Ortiz's which she sees as, quote, a symbol of putrefaction and devastation, unquote. Benitez goes on to address Osorio's Badge of Honor, a crucial work that pairs a teenage boy's bedroom with his father's jail cell and videos of both having a virtual conversation in which they discuss their loneliness and isolation. She describes Osorio's role as a kind of shamanic healer by intervening in the lives of the protagonists of his work. The role of shamanic healer is one that Montañez Ortiz himself also took very, very uh, seriously and frequently sought to play. As early as the mid-1960s, he was already being offered objects to be destroyed as a way of healing. Throughout the 1980s, he created a series of piano and furniture sacrifice rituals in which he acted as a shamanic mediator between the soul of an object, its function and meaning, and the people taking part in the ritual. In returning to this comparison, it may be useful to think about the bed as a symbol of birth, death, the cycle of life, and the human body itself. Some of life's daily rituals may take place on a bed. In the works of these two artists, the bed becomes the bearer of this real and symbolic weight, holding distant memory and immediate present, physicality and invisibility. The bed in both works becomes evidence of violence, passion, humanity, history, culture, memory, and other concepts. Taken together and as part of a larger history, they enrich our understanding of object-based conceptual art. I'd like to return finally to nomenclature. In the end, Louise Chemnitzer sees the limitations of the construction of Spanglish art. He says, it is clearly a natural dynamic of any hegemonic culture to attempt to reduce phenomena such as Spanglish art to an expression of one first and passing generation. However, it is less clear whether, given the conditions generating emigration towards the center, this reduction serves the interests of Spanglish artists and their real and potential audiences. And this might be the real question at hand in terms of our generation of a new or expanded art history. How do strategic essentialisms remain useful as we work towards complete liberation? Continuing to search for a way to describe the historic and contemporary trajectory of U.S. Latinx artists, the idea of joining artists working in very different ways and with very different life experiences is not without problems. As I continue to work on and teach contemporary U.S. Latinx art history, the work is constantly evolving as both new and previously unknown materials emerge or become more readily available. In the end, Latinx art, Spanglish art, Chicano art, Latino art are all ways of describing the production of artists working within the United States around a variety of themes and ideas. 
In the service of radical and ethnic justice, I hope they can be embraced equally by historians, scholars, and institutions of American art as standard bearers of a uniquely American experience. Thank you. Good morning. I'll just settle in. Huh? Um, thank you so much, Marco and Dean. Uh, again, uh, to to echo uh, the other statements about how meaningful uh, it is to be here, especially sharing the space with so many people who have and continue to inform and sustain me. Um, so very moving. Uh, my talk is called Basements, Portals, Adobe, uh, Latinx Artists Reconceiving Institutional Exhibitionary Frameworks. Ten years have passed since the exhibition Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement, uh, opened at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, actually 11 probably. <laughs> Over that time, I have been the guest of many art history, curatorial studies, and visual arts classrooms, and have consistently heard at least one comment from a student, uh, generally Latinx, about how either the experience or textual and visual record of this exhibition played a significant role in how they approached their scholarship or artistic practice. As the history of modern and contemporary art exhibitions, and therefore histories of institutional or counter-institutional practices, has become a central paradigm in the teaching of art and art history, visual remnants and critical reflections have left an indelible impact on the shaping of a new generation of artists and cultural producers. More than ever, experience of exhibitions and public art can be shared through a combination of typical academic and journalistic databases alongside individually posted images, social media shares, and art writing blogs. As, I, as a curator, I understand this to mean that, that more fledgling artists and art professionals have access to a range of images and writings from artists' websites and social media streams to PDFs of formative theoretical texts and critical anthologies. I want to focus on this dispersed field of influence to speculate on how Latinx artists practicing today are having impacts on the curatorial and discursive realms of mainstream art museums. What has changed over the last 10 years since Phantom Sightings? I realize this is somewhat of a personal barometer, but I hope that my reflections on a regional dynamic will have resonance more broadly. I will focus mostly on artists from Southern California, mostly Chicanx, um, and just to say, first uh, of all, the X. <laughs> first of all, the X in Latinx or Chicanx allows for a more layered consideration and consolidation of gender, queerness, race, and ethnicity. That said, the X is less a call for a totalizing unification and more for an accounting for the proliferation and a broader imagining of us. Among the artists I will discuss in this paper, the role of the curatorial is not a posture assumed out of an interest in art historical meta-commentary or professional ambition, but rather a demand to break down the class, racial, and ethnic barriers that continue to keep the upper echelons of museum leadership, as well as the audiences of these spaces, largely white and middle to upper class. It's no secret that artists of color have had to protest and work in concert with community and political support to fight against exclusion and break down barriers of access. Karen Mary Davalos's book, Chicana o Chicano, Remix, Art and Irata since the 1960s, has illustrated how exhibitions that have been 
relegated to footnotes, can now allow the field of Chicanex art to reassess itself, not based on the repeated claim of firsts and discoveries, as she rightly claims that LACMA curators, including myself, have done in touting Los Four um, as the uh, first major museum presentation of Chicano art, but rather to take a more nuanced view of the ecosystem of artists, curators, community-based spaces, university and community college galleries, and local art writers who have contributed to the opening up of multiple access points. My title refers to the basement or the hallway, and that's a more per personal nod to how I understand through a spatial metaphor how artists of color have historically entered into mainstream museums, especially encyclopedic museums, through hall hallways, corridors, plazas, and education galleries, and famously with Osco um, spray painting the facade of a museum. My own scholarship and curatorial projects in Latinx art identify uh, this, this history of spatial mar marginalization. For example, Andine Chavoya and my subtitling, The Osco Retrospective, after Harry Gamboa Jr., The Elite of the Obscure. But also the, affirms the agency, I also want to affirm the agency of the artists uh, in this complex negotiation of the interface with arts, in, arts institutions. Just as the rise of alternative art spaces and culturally specific art or arts organizations played a key factor in the formation of arts collectives, study groups, and journals in the 1970s and 80s, a new confluence of factors seems to be adding a curatorial and structural dimension to the artistic practices of the artists Rafa Esparza, Carmen Argote, and Vincent Ramos. These art artists are reconceiving institutional exhibitionary frameworks through new forms of site responsiveness, institutional fracturing, and phenomenological engagement. The notion of kinship as developed in queer theory is redefining curatorial practice and giving artists agency to leverage their own access to mainstream spaces. In art historian, Margarita Nieto's essay for an exhibition entitled Le Dimont des Anges, co-organized by museums in Nantes and Barcelona in 1989, um, by the way, the first group show of Chicana, Chicano artists to travel to Europe. She writes that Chicano and Mexican Americans' visual narratives are, quote, a rendering of historical memory created by Chicanos and Latinos, ranging from murals graphic work, and more traditional two- and three-dimensional work to assemblage, objects, performance art, installations, video art, film, and social icons committed to the fragmentary and the, uh, and the episodic. This staging of historical memory through fragmentary, episodic modes has been a persistent challenge presented by Chicanex and Latinx artists to the normative structures of museum practice. Material experimentation and medium blurring have long been fodder for uh, conceptual and post-conceptual practices. Alongside experimentation, Latinx artists have also been engaged in labor activism as practitioners of graphic uh, protest in prints and on walls moving from the symbolic realm of representations of laboring bodies. More recent Latinx art incorporates blue collar skills, tools, and materials. Rafa Esparza studied art at East Los Angeles College for seven years prior to transferring to UCLA to complete his BFA in fine arts. He has spoken of the importance of his queer predecessor, predecessors and peers including performance artist Ron Athey, essayist and playwright Ricardo Bracho, musician and performance artist Dorian Wood, dancer and artist Sebastian Hernandez, poet and journalist Raquel Gutierrez, among others, as critical to his ongoing formation. 
His, family, his, his family's history of immigration from Durango, Mexico, as well as their involvement in what has become an integral part of his practice, the construction of adobe, serve as antidote and strategy to counter the typical um, institutional mandates which attend his participation and reception. In the lead up to his participation in the 2017 Whitney Biennial, an exhibition that at this point has become the exemplar for putting, quote, emerging artists on the map and revisiting others who have fallen out of view, Esparza worked with a group of artists to create adobe bricks that would serve, in his words, as a, quote, container for artistic collaboration. As Alicia Inés Guzmán notes in Tierra Ferme, her blog on land art, written from a mestiza perspective, Esparza was given access to the John Eckel Foundation Gallery at the Whitney, the only free space open to the public. The experience of inhabiting this space uh, involved all senses, as one's footing had to adjust to the uneven floor, uh, an uneven adobe floor, and one could smell and touch the jutting fragments of hay and see the cracks on the wall that would continue to manifest over the course of the exhibition. Also discernible were the fingerprints of his collaborators and even the footsteps of coyotes from the terrain surrounding the Los Angeles River where the, where the adobe bricks were originally produced. Esparza would later modify the nomenclature used to describe these types of collaborative projects from container to foundation. In an interview with Art Forum editors, he shared in relationship to his subsequent project at Ballroom Marfa in 2017, quote, within this context, I wanted to experiment with working collaboratively in order to make present and amplify brown artists who might not otherwise have access to establishment art spaces. I wanted us to serve as swords of the land and of each other. Instead of making a container, I made a foundation. I used adobe bricks to cover sections of the floor, but I also used them as a vehicle for having conversations and for inviting other brown artists and artisans to work with me and with each other to consider land and how to create with each other spaces. There's a performativity to this way of working. It informed what we made." End quote. Given the protocols for artist commissions within a biennial structure, a topic that I can't go into detail about but continues to be a major factor in the lead up to the current Winnie Biennial, artists typically sign professional service agreements that offer them institutional, monetary, support for ambitious installations. Um, but in this case, Esparza's commission served as a foundation for Beatriz's, Beatriz Cortez's pyramid of stacked um, igneous volcanic rock, Dorian Ulises Lopez Macias's attentive and lawning photographs of young men from his Mexicano series, um, Eamon Or Giron's In Night Regress, a mural painted directly on the adobe, and Galapores Kim's reconstructed Southwest artifact. Each artist brought her or his approach, whether in the form of queer documentary, installation art, or institutional cr critique, but the overall gesture became one of proliferation and exchange. Located on a parcel of land near, Los, near the Los Angeles River, actually near the neighborhoods of Atwater uh, Village and Cypress Park in Northeast Los Angeles, Esparza's current public installation, Puente, is in collaboration with Beatriz Cortez, Mario, Mario Ayala, and Carla Canseco. The channelized waterway of the Los Angeles River and also the Tehanka Wash has been subject matter and support for many works with various, for many works, with the various performative and marking strategies of artists such as Chaz Bojorquez, Judy Baca, and Asco. Following this legacy of performative strategies from graffiti and muralism to photography, and inspired by the memory of the recent demolition of the Sixth Street Bridge, a conduit that connected Boyle Heights and downtown Los Angeles, the artist constructed pillars for a non-existent bridge. 
As has been the case for Esparza's related Adobe projects, the artists start out their collaborative process by forming a line from the LA River uh, to, the, uh, to work, um, and that leads to the exhibition site. In this case, he used water, gravel, and weeds, all gathered from this, this site. And the artist set out to create a tableau that operate, operates uh, somewhere between their knowledge of shifting of a shifting industrial past and their imagination of a collectively inscribed and embodied future. The relics of the adobe making process, as well as the punctures shot through the stump bridge, were an invitation to treat the unpopulated corridor with its overgrown grasses and sage plants as a portal for viewing as much um, as the provisional state of the pillar might be read to some as sculpture or might be construed as an abandoned development or modern ruin. With a similar sensitivity to architecture and its ramifications on living bodies, Carmen Argote makes sculpture, painting, photography, video, and performance that often times originate, originate from her own experiences with inhabited spaces. Her earliest body of work engaged with a history of unbuilt houses designed by her father, who was trained as an architect in Mexico, but had to shift to blue, blue and white collar jobs when the family immigrated from Guadalajara to Los Angeles in the mid 1980s. With further reflections on the dynamics of class and geographic displacement, Argote produced 720 square feet household mutations, here seen in homes so different, so appealing, curated by Pilar Tompkins Rivas, Chan Noriega, and Maricon Ramirez. This replica of the scale and plan of her family's first home in the US, an apartment in the Pico Union area of Los Angeles, is suspend, suspended from, the, uh, from this pole or from the ceiling, and in fact, grafts the space of occupancy of her family uh, onto the site of the museum gallery. Argote has used the blueprint to transpose the built and the unbuilt, and to materialize the split subjectivity of immigrant lives. In her words, quote, architecture exists apart from the physical structure, in familial myth, in class structures, in shapes, and as an imprint uh, acting upon the body. In the 2015 exhibition, Houses He Wanted to Build, the artist cunningly plays with a manta painting one of her father's designs um, over a house that she, as an artist, uh, cannot afford. Born out of an interest in portability and reuse and informed by Latinx's arts, art, Latinx art's dual concern with historical dimensions and ephemeral action, these home paintings can move in and out of traditional exhibition contexts. For Argote, this is one of her material strategies to create, quote, a point of view that folds over itself to replicate how immigration is an experience that produces layered cultural perspectives. Argote has also referenced the splayed out blanket or manta as used for ad hoc flea markets where vendors lay out their wares on busy city streets. She has made paintings by stamping paint onto a canvas support with cut potatoes, as well as with the stains of coffee grounds. In the exhibition Pyramid, held in an artist-run space and provisional residency site in Los Angeles, uh, Argote pursued various strands of material exper experimentation in her sculpture and paintings, aligning the gestural, stain, and mark-making mark -making impulses with her conceptual inclination to bring, bring the outside in and to surface the sensation. In this large-scale installation entitled Accumulations, Argote uses fencing and pine needles scavenged from the memory of walks through urban corridors to create an expansive drawing in real space out of the materials that usually cordon off and separate. Uh, homes so different, so appealing, and a universal history were, were presented at LACMA as part of PSTLALA from 2017 through early 2018. 
while Home So Different, So Appealing produced a comparative structure based on shared thematic and critical concerns shared by Latinx and Latin American artists, the aim of a universal history of infamy was to decentralize and disperse the thematic through engaging artistic pro processes. Jose Luis Blandet, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, and I invited Chicanex artist Vincent Ramos to produce an installation for one of the venues, as well as to conceive of another segment of the exhibition at LACMA's satellite spy space in Charles White Elementary School, located across from MacArthur Park. Ramos started as a museum guard at LACMA and is drawn to the more eclectic aspects of the museum's history, including the hallway and basement exhibitions that I referenced earlier. He draws from that experience both art historically and sociologically to use the loosest of diagram diagrammatic thinking to layer Chicano references in his sonic and imagistic Rasquache archive. Echoing past uh, basement and hallment hallway installations and bringing to mind Arturo Romo's rendered facade installation from Phantom, Phantom Sightings, Ramos opts to employ the provisional architecture form of the shack, or as he calls it in his title, the anteroom, to spatially reconfigure the museum architecture, almost to playfully or ruefully thumb his nose at the way artists of color have been incorporated in a supplementary fashion. As the invited curator of a section of Universal History of Infamy, Ramos was drawn to the storied history of Charles White Elementary School, which once housed the Otis College of Art and Design, therefore uh, having a, a, a gallery with a significant history. Calling this chapter of the exhibition as the curatorial framework kept with the literary allusions to Borges, Ramos's title, Those of This America, follows his interest of coalescing disparate but compellingly adjacent histories of artistic agitation. Ramos chose and curated works based on their articulation of the body as a transformative tool that both adapts to and resists the political, social, and cultural environment of its specific time and place. He drew from pieces in LACMA's permanent collection, as well as invited the participation of living artists, writers, and social justice activists across generations. Works in this exhibition represented a new generation of emerging Latinx artists like Teresa de la Torre uh, and, and Maria de los Angeles, alongside the established but still un unrecognized Fred Lonadier and Raul Guerrero. The gallery now inhabits, um, inhabits a, an ethnically diverse elementary school campus with many first-generation students. Ramos understood his curatorial gesture to be not only an inscription of his own research, oriented and aesthetic pursuits as an artist, but as a signal to the students of how a dialogue with art could extend into the dimensions uh, of fear and anxiety they are feeling in this era of ramped up uh, criminalization of the immigrant. In conjunction with these engagements with immigrant and working class lives and the centralizing of queer and indigenous perspectives that ha have impacted uh, us, there have been an increase in the number of curators of color in museums. I include this list to emphasize that the increased critical tactics of artists to expand the insular parameters of exhibition spaces also supports our advocacy as curators to grow the presence of artists of color in museum collections. That is to say, artists and curators of color and supportive curators in general are working in concert along with the slowly, uh, along with slowly browning, the slowly browning field of arts journalism to leverage these methodological transformations into something permanent. Uh, hearkening back to Margarita, Margarita Nieto's positioning of the dual impulses of Latinx art, the memorial and the fugitive, it seems appropriate to end with an image of Cortez and Esparza's collaborative work, Portal a floor sculpture made of adobe segments that surround and encase a burgeoning ceiba plant. Esparza and Cortez's use of the ceiba, the sacred world tree in Mayan cosmology, as a form uh, of transtemporal imagining allows us to also consider this as a call to keep this piece alive and to make space for the shape that it may take. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Marco Antonio Flores, Antin Chavoya, Williams College, and the Clark Art Institute for the invitation to join you today. I've titled my presentation From the Inside Out, Museum Strategies for Latinx Art, and I'll be focusing on the work we're doing at the Vincent Price Art Museum. As a museum director, I think a great deal about institutional models, questions of representation and equity in museums, and ways in which museums navigate a range of complex concurrent priorities, including the relevancy of its exhibitions, programs, and collections, the contributions it makes to art historical discourse, its place within its community, the doors it can open for artists, students, and future museum professionals, and of course, the ever-present issues of funding. In many ways, I think of what we do at the Vincent Price Art Museum as an experiment. We are learning and I am learning every day by asking, what can you do with an institution when you centralize art made by people of color and Latinx artists specifically? How far can you go? We know the need for representation and scholarship around Latinx art nationally is critical. What can we contribute, how can we contribute as much as we can with what we have? These are some of the questions that I ask myself daily. Nestled in our two communities of East Los Angeles and the San Gabriel Valley, we know that the very nature of who we are is determined by who we serve. We strive for an expanded dialogue to consider the direct relationships between local arts communities in Southern California and the many, the many intersections of culture that transcend borders and to increase exposure to the variety of cultural practices and conversations at work in the region. The Vincent Price Art Museum sits on the campus of East Los Angeles College. As East LA is an unincorporated part of the city of Los Angeles, the city of Monterey Park annexed the college in the 1970s, so we're literally in both places at once. East LA has over 126,000 residents, 96% of which are working class Latinos. The city of Monterey Park is part of a cluster of cities in the San Gabriel Valley and is one of the largest Asian majority cities in the US, with 67% Asian Americans who are predominantly Chinese. The college's enrollment is currently over 40,000 students. 99% are people of color, with 90% being working class Latino students. It's the fourth largest Hispanic serving institution of higher education in the US, and it's a community college. Our goals over the past few years at the museum have been simple. To foreground the ideas and vision of artists and cultural practitioners, that reflects the diversity of our society, to shift the canon of art history by centering artists of color rather than sidelining them, to bring scholarship and art historical integrity to the work of artists that are underrecognized, to be a national leader in issues of diversity and equity in museums, to be accessible and to listen and respond to the voices of those around us. In this way, we strive to implement curatorial strategies that do several things simultaneously. As we glean the narratives of inclusion and exclusion of artists of color in the art world, we try to respond to the national transitions in art discourse while listening locally. Although I don't include any slides here, I want to note that we don't exclusively show Latinx art. We're not an ethnic specific museum. We have a collection of 9,000 works that span African, Asian, Chicano, Mesoamerican, Mexican, and Native American art, for example. But within the exhibitions we present, we foreground Latinx art, together with Asian American artists and other artists of color. We celebrate the hyper-local art production of Latino LA, and also integrate the work of Latinx artists within hemispheric and global dialogues, and try to contextualize the transnationalism that is at the heart of the experiences of Chicanx and Latinx artists. In short, we do not present Latinx artists in a vacuum, but rather in relationship to the many intersections that inherently taught Latinx art to the world at large. Here are some examples of recent exhibitions, and I'm gonna scroll through very fast. 
Since 2016, VPEM has presented 29 new exhibitions, all representing artists of color. I like to also show images of our audiences because I believe it's important to not only think about what you're showing, but who is engaging with the art? Who is listening to the stories you are telling on the museum walls? And I can talk about any of these shows later if you want. Very interesting to curate an exhibition with Chicano anarchists. <laughs> I dare any one of you in the audience to do it. <laughs> and we have a lot of fun while we're doing that as well. I came to the museum three years ago as only the third director in the institution's 60-year history. When I arrived, we were only a staff of three and a half, and the college only provided $9,000 annually towards exhibitions and programs. Our building, built in 2011, which transitioned the institution from a small college gallery to a full-fledged museum, is 40,000 square feet with seven galleries and a 100-person lecture hall. It's big, and our capacity was small. So I knew that there would be challenges. And I thought to myself, I could look at this as a glass half empty or a glass half full. And I'm forever an optimist. We've grown, we've tripled our attendance, we've fostered new talent in the field, we've created pathways for young people in museum careers, both on site and through our Smithsonian internship program. And working with our Vincent Price Art Museum Foundation, we've increased our annual fundraising by 240%. So how do you get from point A to point B? How do you scale up an institution in a, in a sustainable way, one that you know has the potential to be an incredibly important place? Let me share with you here a few, a few graphs of our working plan. The initial plan from 2016 when I began with a revised plan that I updated like yesterday so I could show you guys. <laughs> um, here are the basic priorities that we decided to, task, to, to tackle. Fiscal growth, collections growth, educational programs, groundbreaking exhibitions, and digital accessibility. These areas were translated into action items, identification of the party primarily responsible for that, the measurable objective, and the timeline. And for better or worse, you see my name under most of the action items <laughs> as the primary person responsible for everything in 2016. As we all know, it takes a lot of elbow grease to make change, and you have to convince people that they should get on board and care. But here we are today, and while the priorities have stayed the same, the objectives have have grown, and thankfully so has our staff. We have a team today of part and full-time staff averaging about 10 total, and our board has stepped up to the plate, and support from foundations and individual donors is building momentum. I'd like to mention another strategy that's been extremely important for the museum's growth, which has been to build strategic partnerships and new initiatives for our institution and for students at East Los Angeles College. Collaborations and partnerships have allowed other institutions the opportunity to access our unique community and has helped us to leverage their much greater financial support and resources. Two years ago, we launched the Smithsonian Undergraduate Internship Program, a diversity pipeline program which sends four students annually to Washington, D.C. for month-long full-time internships within the Smithsonian Institution. Each student is placed with a mentor in any number of diverse areas based generally on their areas of interest, which range from curatorial, education, exhibition design, to archives, conservation, collection management, and development. We've sent two cohorts to DC thus far. Their program begins 
with a week-long Museum Studies intensive program in LA with behind the scenes tours at other LA institutions and a lot of dialogue about the museum field and career pathways. Building on the success of the program, we're currently developing a Museum Studies certificate program at East Los Angeles College that launches this fall. One of the reasons we wanted to do that is we know that community college students also need a bit of a leg up. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to do this. And we're working to maximize the museum's potential as a critical resource within our community and within our educational institution, where we can be a hub, a laboratory, and a home to students interested in careers in the arts. We also have an, an invaluable partner in LACMA, who's mounted three exhibitions from their permanent collection at VPAM with exhibitions of Chinese ceramics, Egyptian art, including bringing a mummy to East LA, and a photography exhibition of works by Mariana Jampalski. The partnership has not only enabled us to share incredible works of art that otherwise wouldn't be very accessible to members of our local community, it also brings LACMA's expertise in educational programming. By working with LACMA's community engagement staff, Programs have been developed that build bridges to specific groups and organizations within East LA and the San Gabriel Valley, creating new dialogues and conversations and inviting people to the museum with direct educational opportunities. We've also begun a partnership with the Huntington and were recently invited to curate two artists who spent last summer researching the Huntington collections to create new work. Mario Ibarra Jr. and Carolina Caicedo were the two invited artists. And I'm pleased to say that we will be co-acquiring the video Carolina produced together with the Huntington. This is a still from that video. The Huntington also made their museum free to students from East Los Angeles College for four months. And the cost of the, their museum is something like $25, $27, so prohibitive for East Los Angeles College students, and we're only about 15 minutes away from the Huntington. Um, and we're planning on placing interns from the college within their curatorial departments in the coming year. I also want to discuss a project which has been of particular importance to the museum, which is Laura Aguilar Show and Tell, the first comprehensive retrospective of the photographer. Aguilar's work traverses performative, feminist, and queer art genres, offering candid portrayals of the artist, her friends and family, and LGBTQ and Latinx communities. Her practice reflects her struggles to negotiate and navigate her ethnicity and sexuality, her challenges with depression, her disabilities including auditory dyslexia, and the acceptance of her large body. This, this exhibition, which received wide national acclaim, tells the story of the artist who struggled to communicate with words, yet emerged as a powerful voice for numerous and diverse marginalized groups. Laura, who so sadly passed away last year, hailed from the San Gabriel Valley and got her start in photography as a student at, Ela at East Los Angeles College. Interest in her work was widespread after the exhibition, but as is all too common with under-recognized artists of color, her work had never been fully cataloged or archived. After the exhibition and publication, VPEM junior staff worked with her estate to do a complete cataloging of all of her prints so that it could be properly evaluated. And we connected her estate with an advisor to manage the institutional interest in her work. Subsequently, Laura's work is now entering the collections of the Met, the Whitney, the Tate, the Getty, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and many others, and VPAM is co-acquiring a large suite of prints together with LACMA. Here are some images, more images of her work, of Laura and of visitors. And I don't mean to embarrass anyone, but um, when I sat in the office of the head photo curator of one of these major museums, she said to me, why didn't I know about Laura's work before? Do other Latino photographers exist? I said, yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, but it takes attention, interest, and financial support 
to bring any artist's work to light. Of course, we know that is the challenge we face in the field of Latinx art. We need the opportunities to make the art and the artist visible. And we can't wait for that to just happen. We have to work to make it happen every day. Further to that point, as, as we all know, we need more people representing diversity within museums. It's critical, and we all have to do our part, our part to foster that support. At VPEM, we strive to be an incubator site for mentoring and training young people of color in the museum field. In addition to our Smithsonian Museum Studies internship program for ELAC undergraduates, annual support from institutional partners with internship or apprenticeship diversity initiatives, including the Getty, ICALA, and the Broad, further VPAM as a training ground for young people of color. The museum's part-time junior staff, all recent graduates beginning their professional careers, are 100% people of color, and they work closely with me on all aspects of curatorial and exhibition planning, public programs, communications, and collections management. On a final note, I have this graph that actually isn't rooted in hard data, so I want to qualify that. <laughs> but it's my, and it's hard to present that to an audience like you guys that know everything about everything. But it is my own kind of speculation about the Latinx art world. On the left, you see the general areas of the art world at large. All these areas work in tandem to propel the art sector forward. On the right, this is my perception of the Latinx art world. We have a whole lot of art and artists, but not a lot of the rest. While we have some presence in academia, art schools, and in the curatorial field, we still need a lot more representation in terms of areas such as museum and private collections, the press, and within the, the market. There's an extremely limited secondary market for Latinx art in the auction system, or none. And while it might not seem directly relevant to issues of representation in museums, it is in fact very related. Everything operates within an economy, and we must be mindful of the many modes in which art circulates. As we move the field of Latinx art forward, I hope that we will see advancement across all sectors of the art world. Thank you. Uh, so if um, Rocio and Rita and Pilar could come back up for our conversation. That was such a fantastic panel. Thank you all so much. And I also want to begin by, of course, thanking, yes, Ray. Thank you, of course, to Andine, um, who's such a hero of mine and has been so transformative in the field of art history. And thank you also to Marco, who I have known for many years um, as a student and now increasingly as a colleague. It is really a special pleasure to see him um, take his rightful place among the um, emerging cohort of committed Latinx curators and art historians. And I know that we will continue our collaboration for many years. Um, I have a, I have pages of notes, and obviously I'm not going to make my own um, talk here in an impromptu fashion uh, to, as a way to respond, because there were so many interesting um, and important issues that you all three brought out, and I want to have the time for you to talk to each other, and then also time for the audience to ask questions. So I think I'll just start by making one large observation that might lead to other questions, which is the, um, and it a little bit goes directly off of Pilar's final um, pie charts, which were super intriguing. Um, and it's really about the question of the multiple institutions that, sorry, this is not like, in, I can't, I want to be able to see you a little more. <laughs> sorry, and that Carol Gillian, you know, women want to face each other. <laughs> Um, so the multiple institutions that all three of you um, at some point were engaging with, so the institution of art history, the institution um, that is to say of the academy, 
um, the institution obviously of the museum, but very helpfully, I think you all three alluded to how non-monolithic, of course, the museum is. So someone like Ramos, a former museum guard, um, the, the work of Argote makes me think of the important work of the art handler, you know, such very detailed work that requires a lot of support systems. There's direct directors, curators, I mean, just all the different kind of like sub-institutions within the bigger institution of the museum. Then there's, you know, the what, what we could arguably call the institution of reception, which includes critics, the you know, audience members, blogs, social media, you know, how image flows out, you know, between and throughout um, the spaces of, of production and the spaces of reception that sometimes are sort of extra art institutional. They don't always kind of get channeled through a, a sort of official space. Um, you also all alluded in some way or another to the institution of racial designation itself, the institutionalization of Latinx identifications, you know, the long-standing and very troubled history of the institu institutionalization of, the, of Hispanic and all the complications around those designations. Um, what Pilar referred to as ethnic specific. Um, so that's an, another institution that I felt like was being kind of complicated and troubled by all three of you. And lastly, the institution of art itself and how so much of the art that has mattered for some Latinx art histories has actually been historically excluded from that category altogether. So things like textiles, much indigenous making, some of the work that Pilar was showing of you know, subcultural garments and tennis shoes. I mean, these are not things that have ordinarily been um, admitted into the very specialized institution of art. So I guess as my first question for all three of you is, Given these different interlocking institutions, um, how do you understand the uh, um, the present? I get the question is is not as simple as kind of reform or revolt, but I guess what happens to all of those um, when we think about a kind of conscious Browning, as Esparza would say, or as Rita was talking about, what happens when the institution, when all those institutions become browned? I have a first thought about that, and thank you for that very thorough overview of kind of contextualizing all of our presentations together. Um, but one of the things that I, I feel is liberating in a brown institution is that we don't have to say in every single exhibition title, so and such and such Latinx art or you know Latino art from you know yada 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 yada. We don't have to use the term. We can just be. And that, for me, is a huge transition. And you know, previously working at LACMA, you know, there, or at other institutions, there's always that struggle that goes on within the institution that you have to give it some frame. You have to give it some ethnic frame. You have to give it. You have to locate it within a group or in a time period. Always, right? So um, within an institution that is inherently brown, we don't have to do that in the way that you, that mainstream artists don't do that either. So that's been uh, liberating. Another thing has been um, the opportunity to um, showcase, showcase things that are part of material culture that also represent Latinx cultural production at large. And as you say, you know, if it's a t-shirt or tennis shoes, but it represents something that's very significant in terms of um, production, then, then we do it and we don't have to answer to anybody for that. Yeah, Rocio, I thought it was really great, um, your call for specificity. You know, uh, acknowledging, of course, the importance sometimes of aggregation, but also, you know, why not have a more hyper-local designation? I think it matters, right? Because it's about where were people born, then where did they go to art school, who were their colleagues in art school, what was the city they were living in at the time, and then eventually where they make the rest of their career. Um, and it, it, every week, I find new articles for or against the term Latinx. Uh, and so it's it's something to think about when we're talking about, I think it is powerful to talk about us as a group, um, but it's really important to, I think, think about the integrity of the artist as a human being first and their experience, and that becomes much more useful in telling a fuller story. Yeah, I mean, I think there's that, that humanistic dimension, but I think also thinking as I've been thinking about um, 
Laura Perez talks since last night, overnight, but this, this sort of sensitivity to <coughs> that, that uh, we can bring, all of us can bring to, to the sort of multiple temporalities. So I think that's part of it too uh, in our kind of constant grappling with these linguistic definitions is that uh, we're also kind of grappling too with these sort of simultane simultaneity of of histories in different conditions. And we're trying to account for them and kind of have them conform, but they, they can't. So we just have to try to create these multifarious you know, sites for them to, to coexist. I think that's what, interesting when, interestingly, when, when Pilar, when you said uh, you're kind of setting it apart from, but you know you're also connected to the history of ethnic specific museums you have that respect and you acknowledge that lineage. But at the same time, you're like, but we're in this between and betwixt these, these communities. We have our Asian American, uh, Chicanex, Latinx, the, the changing dimensions too of Los Angeles. It's not just Chicano-centric anymore <laughs> as we've been living for so long. We're really shaking that up and I think you, you get that and you're, you're trying to be responsive to it by keeping it moving, you know? It's hard with an institution, though, because they don't, they don't move and they don't shift. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. One of the uh, um, things I was also noting about the approaches all three of you were taking were different models for thinking about um, kind of conventional, what we could call conventional art histories. I mean, there are many things that are art history, but, you know, art history, I mean, it's often joked that someone, you know, anyone with two slide projectors can be an art historian, that it's really based on this, like, comparison. Not anymore, because they don't anymore. make this yeah, slide. Exactly. But the idea that, like, but comparison always points to, or can often, very simplistically, point to a model of influence, you know? The one on the left is first, and there's one on the right. And influence, as we taught, you know, as you all pointed out, or the idea of firsts, or the idea of origins, you know, really um, problematic, especially when we're thinking about different temporalities and more kind of spiraling times, etc. So I was thinking about other words you were using to map what we could, you know, affinities maybe, and one of them, um, Rita brought up the idea of kinship. Another was adjacency, which I really liked. Andine, of course, um, in his show Access Mundo, tried to map a network, which I also thought was nice, or like a constellation, the idea of collaboration, partnership. I mean, just all these, or the, you know, I, um, affinity, also the, the idea that people could be accomplices, you know going beyond the idea of allyship. So I just thought of all these other words, you know, beyond comparison that to me felt like whole new methodologies for practicing art history. Yeah, you know, um, Carmen Ramos, the curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, has used in the past the word participation in a really, I think, significant way, talking about how these artists were equally participating in the moment that art history was being made. And then um, at LAN, actually, just before LAN, uh, we had a um, meeting at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and Chon Noriega used the word meanwhile. So his idea was like, while all of this was going on, every, this all, you know, it's all happening at the same time, but if you think about meanwhile as a, as a way of, as a rubric for thinking, other things are going on too if you just look outside of that little mainstream. I love that. Do, you, do Rita or Pilar want to? Well, and this actually kind of stems from even conversations I was having yesterday and thinking about rethinking ways that we approach Latinx art because I, 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 you know, I think of it in terms of how I've studied it as kind of, you know, coming out of a specific uh, effort to aggregate content, information, art historical knowledge, and that in some ways, you know, draws um, a circle around what especially Chicano art is supposed to be. But then when you're actually working with the artists, being led by them and hearing from their conversations, there's so much nuance, there's so much intersection, um, there's so many you know, different uh, influences that are present in their work. And, um, and, and I think you know, in terms of the approaches that we're, we're taking in our scholarship and our work, it's, it's becoming more, more broad, perhaps. And, and, and we're seeing that within the exhibition models as well. Right? Yeah, I, I think too the idea of entanglement. I mean, the meanwhile um, is almost like there's distance uh, presumed, you know, which I think is actually lovely because things do co-emerge. Um, but there also is um, 
this, a sense of great intimacy when you think about some of these um, clusters of artists who did all know each other, work with each other, were friends with each other, and the idea that, you know, it's not, it really influences just really such a, um, there's such a deficit to that word when things are so, it could, could, could be understood to be so much more of this kind of like cauldron of creativity, you know, um, and that we could just have many other words. And I think for myself, some of these um, models and approaches um, that have started or have been innovated within the fields of um, Chickenex and Latinx art history, to me, are um, suggestive for all of art history. I mean, it's not; these are not just things that can be confined to that. I mean, these are central to the questions um, of the field today. So, I'm wondering if you two have, if you three have questions for each other, or if we want to open it out to the audience. I had more of a comment, actually, Reed. I'm really grateful for you bringing up this idea of where do artists get their start and if they're going to be in an institution somewhere and how are those um, side places that are not the gallery or not inside the institution, how do they become like the first gesture towards, and it made me think of that essay by John Yao about um, Wilfredo Lam that was called Please Wait by the Coat Room because Lam's painting was by the coat check at the Museum of Modern Art for such a really long time. And you know, I think about past Whitney Biennials before they moved to the new building, for example, one year I remember there were three Puerto Rican artists in the exhibition, but they were in the hall on the way to the bathroom, outside the museum, and the third uh, was a performance artist, so you would only actually see the work if you actually were there during the performance. You know, and it's something that um, continues to happen, and it's something, I think, to think about how to incorporate artists into the meaningful spaces of the institution. And then I'll just say one more thing that I think is important also to think about. When large mainstream institutions begin to do their diversity work, <clears throat> Um, how small organizations like VPAM, like El Museo, um, like the Bronx Museum, like Self Help Graphics, who have been doing the work since the late 1960s, um, I think there needs to be, and, I, and I'm so happy to see partnerships between LACMA and VPAM, and I wish there were more kind of partnerships and collaborations like that where the mainstream can learn from the smaller organizations that have you know, all created in the post-civil rights era for a reason, right, for lack of representation and thinking about that intellectual richness that exists in those smaller um, uh, organizations that are also oftentimes hanging on by a thread in terms of funding, um, how these collaborations can really enrich the stories that are being told. Yeah, I think that was the point too, uh, you know, in bringing up um, Karen Mary Davalos's book too, that's just suggestive of the, the histories of, of artists of colors, uh, artists of color practices in the United States is that you, uh, the mainstream art, art historical modes and institu institutions have to acknowledge that the, the initial uh, advocacy action and collaborations took place um, in a network of community college spaces, uh, ethnic specific museums, artist run spaces and that you have to then privilege those spaces as the ones who came before, <laughs> who acknowledged and laid the groundwork that you are then following up on. You know, you are not leading. <laughs> you are actually catching up. Exactly. The, the larger institutions are catching up. Super. And it does, it seems to me very often happen that in the larger institutions where any attempt to kind of cultivate browning of the audience gets happens with programming or with education, you know, and not necessarily with art on the walls in the galleries, right. you know, and that that kind of, that, that, that's a, um, I mean, those are very important aspects, programming and education, but it can't only happen there. Maybe we could have, um, I know there's quite a robust audience. I already see hands. I see many hands. I'm supposed to moderate, but I don't see, I can't, maybe there could we can't be. can't see so much. <laughs> I saw Roberto. Uh. Oh, somebody was handing it Okay, Adriana. 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 <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Okay, so quickly, I just wanted to add to that, that at the MFA Houston um, Ford Foundation event that preceded Lon, the artist Vincent Valdez, I think it was, said, you know, think critically, he said this to the institution, think critically about bringing the community of color into the museum to witness, I'm paraphrasing, to witness your business as usual. Instead, put the leadership and the curators on the bus and take them to the barrio, right? 
Which I think can be problematic, but I think it's also an interesting yeah, provocation, can, right? <laughs> I've been on... <laughs> no, but I think... But, That's not... Yeah, that could be problematic, too. No, it can be very uh, problematic, but I think the point is, is that there have been so many um, problematic attempts to not change business as usual and just assume through educational programming that you're going to, to you know, inculcate the community of color into the dominant mainstream. And I, I just, I think you just have to remix that. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I thought it was an interesting provocation. Um, I have uh, thoughts that Rita's talk raised for me, but quickly first, the, on the deficit of you know, influence is terrible and poor. Um, but lately I've been, in the last couple months, dwelling on Michael Baxendahl's list of 46 verbs to, as his remedy to that, which he also finds totally wrong. And um, those verbs are incredible. They're in Patterns of Intention, the 1985 book. Um, yeah, so there's that. But Rita, the, it's, it was amazing to watch you articulate how those artists' works have changed exhibition practices because two of the same artists have changed how I've thought about work at the archives, uh, the Archives of American Art. And the two moments I'll point to is at the ballroom show, Rafa's bar, ballroom show, um, standing in the room where now Bustamante's work was mounted, and especially the, you know, she, she had altered historical footage there that crossed over into the realm of artwork, but there was one video that was the title Chuck Mool, I think, the 100 plus year old woman sitting in the Chuck Mool position, just speaking her oral history, basically. And um, seeing that very raw primary source document film, but standing in that browned container made me think about, oh, what if like all our acid-free boxes at the archives were Adobe boxes instead? <laughs> <laughs> like, and how that changes what we think about memory and material culture. And then uh, Carmen Argote's contribution to the Mitiera exhibition in Denver a couple, last year, a couple years ago, she simply sent the screen that divided her studio that has all her, her her papers, the Carmen Argote papers, hanging yeah. on them. It's she called said, live work. Yeah, yeah. that uh, seeing those documents that are in our scope at the archives presented that way and straight from the studio was really amazing. And then finally, uh, Chaz Bajorque is, uh, is the only artist who has customized boxes in the archives, um, except for Florence Knoll, the designer who made these beautiful felt-covered ones that lived up, you know, live up to the archival standards. So we kept them uh, in Knoll's case and in Chaz's case as well. So. Thank you for a very rich panel. I, I, um, I think you all presented something that has been troubling me or, or that I've been trying to figure out, uh, Rita, Rocio, Pilar, and Julia, in your, in your um, summary, which is this question that I believe that Latinx art history actually can radically transform our conventional understandings of art history precisely because we cannot rely on just one disciplinary frame. And it seems to me that all the work that you displayed today or showed requires a deep understanding of immigration studies. Because the difference between, say, the 60s and 80s uh, exile artists compared to the very different and radically uh, hostile environment uh, between the United States and Mexico, to speak only of that border, uh, requires a different way of thinking about how does immigration change practices, and I think, Rita, you described precisely, I think, the way in which queer net, uh, kinships are, are ways of, of rethinking the way that uh, assumptions about new immigration uh, artists or artists who, who are addressing that uh, changes the way in which, the perspective in which we have to think through the art historical frame, which, again, opens up temporalities in ways that um, I think can be beneficial for, for the larger field. Yeah, I really agree. I think that's important to think about those um, very specific histories. And what's interesting now is we have a new um, migration north, right? There's a second wave or a new wave or the most recent wave of, of uh, migration north. And so those stories will continue to be influenced and affected by immigration policies and status, mixed status, families. All of that, I think, is really important to think about when interpreting the work and creating a new history of art. Um, hi. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for your amazing presentations. Um, 
as being raised in LA and witnessing the work at the Vincent Price and LACMA, Rita and Pilar, it's just an honor to share space with you. Um, but I, I really wanted to um, talk about this concept, Rita, that you brought up in your talk about um, kinship as a major part of kind of artists um, thinking about curatorial practice. Um, and I was wondering if each of you could maybe speak to the way in which kinship has played into your own curatorial work. Well, I think that the, us being up here in a way, you know, obviously we're, we're from around uh, sort of proximity in terms of, of generation and cohort, and of course with Andine uh, cohort. So, um, you know, there, there's that, there's that sense of uh, mutual understanding or support that also interconnects with the ways in which uh, the artists that that we have the honor of uh, of advocating for uh, are also operating. Um, I think the complexity, and maybe y'all can speak to this too, is when you're trying to translate those forms of cooperation and collectivity, or trying to you know get that sense of mutual understanding within a larger institutional or foundation framework. Um, of course, we have, in terms of some of the, the leaders within the field of, of, of cultural uh, foundation, someone like Tomas Ibarra Frausto, who enacted, embodied that kind of form of conviviality, as he called it, um, and, and correspondence. So, of course, we've got our generational forebearers who have, have, have kind of laid the groundwork in terms of that generosity. But um, it's, it's hard to sometimes historicize that or document that aspect, and which is not to say it's all love and peace all the time, but, that, but it's a great part of it. And I think, of course, that, is, that owes quite a bit to queer and feminist praxis as well. Now, if you want to say. Well, I think that kinship has been crucial. You know, it's been uh, essential, really. Um, I mean, it's it's exciting. I I, I was really taken uh, at the last lawn conference to see sort of a, a whole new generation of people working in the field. But I I, I think in years prior, it's just felt so much smaller, and um, and people looking out for each other has been you know part of that. And certainly, we have um, you know our heroes like Tomas Ibarra Frausto, um, you know, who who really have through as Rita has said, you know, through their generosity of spirit, um, you know, led us. But I think there's been a lot of, of um, collaboration. And, of course, you know, Rita and I have known each other for probably 15 years or more. And, uh, and some of those conversations, you know, take place outside of the partnership of what we might be working on. But thinking even to other issues that, you know, that Latinx art faces is, Where's, where are the collectors? Where are the individuals that can help to support these projects? I mean, we, that's like an ongoing conversation. So sometimes it might not even be from an art historical perspective, a curatorial perspective, but how do you functionally make it work? And how do you also open other doors and pathways to you know, positions? And I know, you know John Noriega, for example, very influential in my life, and as well with Rita. Um, you know, those, uh, you know, Mark Bradford was an early mentor of mine, and he told me that it was my obligation to open the door for other young people of color. And at the time, I was like, who, me? I can't do anything. I don't have any agency. But, um, but I've always taken that to heart and listened to it, and now I try to do it every single day. So, I mean, I think that's a lesson, you know, in that, in that kinship as well, that it's also intergenerational and uh, something to strive for. Yeah, the essay that I quoted from Amalia's essay, when I first found it, I found it at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston Amazing Digital Archive. It had no date or anything on it. And um, I wrote to her to ask you know, what the year of the publication was. She wrote me back immediately. And it's people like, like Tomas and, and Amalia who have really been key. There was a presentation that I was preparing for Ford, and there were two groups of people that I would not dream of presenting it without presenting it to them first and getting their blessing, and one was Amalia, and the other was the U.S. Latino Art Forum, because Adriana and her crew, I think, are you know, representing the intergenerational group of people who are working on this field, and I think that kind of kinship of um, understanding that it's all a work in progress, and the more uh, information that we're, the, we share with one another, the richer it all is. 
That question too makes me think about the root word of curate, which is to care, and how you know curating is not just about caring for objects made in the past or caring for histories, caring for memories, etc. But you know, caring for each other in a way, or that that could that is one model that maybe could be embraced um, and would be generative. Thank you for that amazing panel. That was just really fabulous in so many different ways. But the very last, uh, one of the very last things that you just mentioned, who's buying art? And um, I'm wondering, who is buying, you know, what do you know about Chicano art, you know, collectors? Who's buying it? Who's buying it now? Or Yeah, I mean, who's buying it now? I remember when that three-part, uh, those, those volumes came out, um, Oh, uh, who was it who did them? And, and yes, thank you, George Keller. Yeah, and I, I was not there at a session, but someone told me that he was really encouraging people to start buying a lot of of uh, Chicano art. I don't know if he said Latino or Chicano, but that he thought that would really take off. At that time, when I heard it, I thought, wow, this is kind of interesting. There's like a parallel with, you know, the excitement uh, for collecting Latin American art, like in the, you know, in the 30s. But I'm not sure what actually happened. Did you know? Did it take off the purchasing of, of uh, Chicano and other U.S. Latino art? I was gonna. I was gonna mention. Uh, you know, a couple of the artists that I mm -hmm. talked about. They show with a gallery in Los Angeles called Commonwealth and Council, and this is a gallery that I think is really you know paradigm shifting because not all galleries have on their websites, uh, a mission statement. <laughs> it's you know, sort of like a quasi-mission statement. But it is, they really sort of, uh, it was started by someone who trained as an artist at, at UC Irvine. And he came out and was very committed to starting, um, you know, it's a business, but a gallery that would focus on artists of color. There are very few, uh, Mar uh, sort of market-based galleries that have that intention and have that commitment. But the more we see that, and the more we see uh, than other like hip galleries trying to kind of catch on to that, then I think you'll see more support. Just in, in terms of what, right now what's happening. Um, I do wanna also just sort of nod, I know that this whole <laughs> debate around um, what's happening at El Museo. I don't want to open that Pandora's box, but I do think it was interesting that the the decision was made when Patrick Charpenel was asked to do a special section uh, to kind of account for the history of El Museo, that he made that strategic decision to place Latinx and Latin American artists in freeze because you just you do not see freeze as sort of the major kind of global phenomenon in terms of a contemporary um, art fair th that uh, you would not ever see a focus on Latinx art at, at freeze. So uh, that's, you know, it's slow, it's incremental. And I'm talking about at the upper scale, of course there's been a long history of grassroots advocacy <coughs> in terms of collecting, but I'm talking about, you know, entering the kind of mainstream. It's still very uh, slow. I just wanted to, you know, say something that um, when Pacific Center Time LA LA was taking place, uh, one of the things that I remember mentioning at like a press conference or something was that I really hoped that after the whole initiative was over, that seeing U.S. Latino art in major museums would just be a normal thing, that we would go through this process of normalization rather than essentialism and, you know, having it just be very, you know, few and far between in terms of, of, uh, of, of presence. And I do feel that there's a little bit of a trickle-down effect, you know, than that, than when you see, you know, the, the institutional success, the attention in the media and the press, then, you know, the market interest starts to build. Um, it becomes more normalized in galleries and then, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, Carmen Aragote being represented by a Colombian gallery that participates mm -hmm. in, in global art fairs. I mean, it's sort of creeping in, though there have always been collectors of Chicano and Latino art and there's major people, but it's still, you know, a handful of folks rather than, um, you know, these kind of broader uh, uh, groups of collectors globally that are paying attention. But I think all of that really will 
speak to the health of the future of Latinx art, because as I mentioned in my slide, I mean, it all, it all um, affects the economics, and that goes back into the institution, and then to the curatorial, and then to the collections, and all of those areas, so they, they're intertwined. I just wanted to say in terms of um, institutional collecting, you know, all of the institutions that we've been talking about are mostly hanging on by a thread financially, including El Museo. Yeah. And, um, you know, Deborah Cullen, who's with us today, was chief curator at El Museo for years, was really successful in getting grant from, I think it was the Gelman Trust, specifically to acquire things for the collection that were by living artists and especially a group of Dominican artists living and working both in DR and in, in the United States. So it's become like the only collection of contemporary Dominican American art in an institution. And that continues to be so important to think about those groups that are still being excluded. It, it, it so often is such an easy bad word in seminars that I sometimes teach, um, museumification or commodification. You know, that's kind of like a student wants to say that to kind of put the discussion you know, to stop the discussion about a piece because somehow it's entered the museum and forget it. It's like lost all of its politics or somehow it's been drained of its urgency when it has a price tag on it. And, you know, it's so important to um, always be aware that like we are all, you know, existing within capitalism at every minute right now. Um, and the, the, that is how artists are supported, you know, having their work enter some kind of marketplace, like actually, or building a collector base, et cetera, like having them, in, you know, in, become part of a permanent collection, like that guarantees ongoing legibility and visibility for the future. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, Rita, I'm, I'm struck by how you started with the, the hallway, the basement, the antechamber as sort of like a place for Latinx artists to come in and subvert, um, but also Pilar with the ways VPAM is sort of extending out into other uh, museums and sort of in, in, in incorporating these programs and these internships at the ICA and at the Huntington and sort of having free admission and things like that. Because often I see sort of like diversity programs at big museums where, you know, you get a bunch of people of color in and there's not really a support system for those for those young people. and. I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking if you, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this idea of like subversion and being able to create a foundation through uh, subversion, sort of like entering through the back door, if you will, but then sort of creating this sort of container or foundation that, that Rafa talks about sort of um, building up opportunities within like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like exactly what I was, was hoping to, um, to convey, you know, that, uh, of course, it's important to acknowledge the those who sort of laid the the groundwork. But I'm, I'm so glad, Alex, that you acknowledged to uh, a, an ongoing problem. And Rocio and I just looking at each other and nodding of uh, with the uh, with these um, um, uh, pipelines is that once once someone comes in, then there's also kind of no network of support. Um, that that I just wanted to echo that and say that again because it's very it's very critical what you're saying um, and it, it also of course puts it puts a lot of pressure on those few of us who are residing within those mainstream institutions um, but then it kind of goes back to those lessons that we're learning from each other and lessons we're learning methodologically from from the artists in terms of conviviality and kinship that we then, I think as Pilar so beautifully put it, must you know, work on this every day. I think Mark Bradford said that same thing to me. <laughs> and he's, you know, he's great at that. He's great at uh, reinforcing that, that, that powerful message that we still need to keep on, uh, keep on keeping on for each other. It's, it's a very slow process. You know, it's a very slow and, and torturous process. I think it's going to be another number number of generations before we see it. We're not going to see that change on the upper level directorially for some time, but you know, hopefully, 20 years from now, we'll we'll have some impact on that uh, upper level. Yeah, I was just also going to add that um, I'm glad that you brought up that you know that that question of support for 
people of color once they get into institutions and um, as we have a diversity pipeline program now and I'm gonna be presenting in New York uh, next week with other, uh, alongside other um, program managers for similar programs and we've had a number of pre-conversations in conference calls where we've brought up these issues of support for young people once they get into these institutions since there's now a proliferation of a number of different programs that are taking place nationally. And um, and it's something that I, I see again and again is that people need a lot of support. Um, <clears throat> and, and as we build our museum studies certificate program and in my conversations with the other uh, educators at our college, I've, I've, I've brought this up and we're gonna insist on having you know, counseling <laughs> available to people because mental health issues related to being a person of color in a white institution, it's very real. So, um, and, and for, you know, for young people, in, you feel ostracized, you feel like a fish out of water, and um, there's a lot of anxiety that can go along with that, and so um, that's one of the things that I'm trying to be mindful of, and we're trying to be mindful of at our institution, is that you can't just plop people in, and, and just because you made up the program, expect it all to work. Um, you have to really, you know, be there, be present, be there for them. So, I think it's something to think about. I just want to follow up on that because it's pertinent right now. I was going to talk about it later this afternoon, but something that concerns me, and I think partnership is going to be key here, is that um, these, these mentorship programs and these fellowship programs are great, and I'm so glad you're doing a museum certificate program, but the reality is that the mainstream museums, of which there are hundreds, that don't yet have specialists in any art that is not mainstream art, they all hire people with PhDs in art history. And the fundamental fact is, is that there are only 10 universities with graduate programs, with faculty who specialize in Latinx art. So where will the young people that are entering these fellowship programs go on for graduate st study? And so I think I'm always in awe of the incredible work, particularly the three of you have been doing for such a long time now, and that Sean has been doing, and that Andine has been doing here at Williams. But I really think we have to put pressure on universities um, to make change, because it's never to say that a student can't simply work with a contemporaneous. I mean, I worked with a 19th century specialist of German and French art, right? So I think you learn to ask different sets of questions when you can't work with a mentor directly in your field. But there also have to be academic mentors in these fields because there is a degree of, I mean, I, you know, I had to teach myself U.S. Latinx art. I taught by reading your essays and I taught by seeing your, I learned by seeing your exhibitions. But that's an incredible amount of additional labor because it's also expected of us that we learn the canon, right? And of course there's value in doing that too. But I really, my concern right now is the way that universities are dropping the ball. And so I think that foundations need to begin to take universities to task for still not getting with the program. So I just wanted to add that. Okay, so we have uh, room for one more question. Hi, thank you all for speaking. It's like the Avengers. It's, it's like, <laughs> it's amazing to see all y'all in one space. Anyway, Rita, I had a question about the Instagram residency program that you initiated with Guadalupe Rosales. And that- I'm sorry, What was that, I'm sorry. The Instagram residency that you did in Oh, with Guadalupe, okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't and I okay. just, because you had been talking about the spatial marginalization, but Guadalupe works in the digital, and looking at the comments throughout the stream of that residency, a lot of people tried to see her in the museum space, and they were kind of confused as to what the residency was and where the artwork was, and, and she, there was a lot of experiences with like metadata and how she was very much specific about the nomenclature of using Chicano art in, in the hashtags. And I, I was just wondering if you could talk about that experience. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like it didn't work so directly with Lupe because she was so, um, it was such an exper experiment, really, <laughs> for, for us and for her. And 
what it, I mean, speaking of this term sort of adjacencies or, you know, critical interventions, what does it mean to sort of occupy a virtual space, to occupy a space, uh, as she actually just does at large in her work, because this is, you know, uh, a virtual archive. I mean, there's material remnants, and some people do give her the materials for her to, you know, entrust them with her. But she's also kind of, what does it mean to be an archivist? I'm learning on the fly, I'm an artist. So these sort of, um, the, the kind of liminal nature of, what, of how she exists as an artist slash artist slash archivist slash activist, that liminality too then kind of transferred over to the, the, the kind of a total experiment of taking it over, taking over. And I like the idea that it was a takeover because uh, although we did talk and she was talking really closely, really more closely with the, the head of, of digital media, it was really more about how they were gonna do that choreography between the quote unquote official and uh, I always like to use Mario Ibarra's term, the or official, <laughs> you know, the or official. Uh, she very much took that up. Um, so there were, there were very strange ways too that we would have to, she would have to deal with that kind of internalize that confusion or critical response as much as she was also getting like heaps of incredible, uh, you know, the kind of consistent responses that she really gets that are always out of recognition. Um, and I'm so glad to see this here, and I'm so glad to see this connected with LACMA and kind of opening up that oh, curiosity of, oh, okay, what, you know, there's a place for us, you know, there's a place for us. So, um, yeah, I guess that I, I should have included that because that's another kind of back channel in a way, although I, I, find like, I find that's actually much more globally prominent in the world because more people are actually interfacing with the museum vis-a-vis -vis social media than actually stepping through the gates, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks again to our panelists and we will see you in this afternoon. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, bienvenidos. Um, I hope you all had a good lunch, nice break, and uh, for some of our visitors, I hope you also got to see some of the, some of the landscape and some of the museum. Um, our next panel brings together three brilliant scholars whose work exemplifies and put into practice Interdis interdisciplinarity and intersectionality across a range of media and methodologies. And I think in some ways what this panel will do will be a continuation of what um, one of our speakers this afternoon, Dr. Roberto Tejada, mentioned in the, in the earlier Q, uh, the Q and A following the first panel, um, that I think this panel will really exemplify the various ways that as, as Professor Tejada suggested, Latinx art can radically transform art history because we cannot simply rely on any single disciplinary frame. Um, so I'll introduce the three speakers and the moderator and then ask them each to come up uh, onto stage in turn and then they'll assemble for the Q&A uh, afterwards uh, on stage. So our first speaker, um, Ramon Rivera Sivera is a professor of performance studies in art theory and practice at Northwestern University. His books include Performing Queer Latinidad, Dance, Sexuality, Politics, and Blacktino Queer Performance, and Performance in the Borderlands. He hasn't been busy at all. And his forthcoming book is titled Regaton's Queer Turn, Sexuality, Abstraction, and Contemporary Art in the Circum Caribbean. Part of what, uh, and you'll be reflecting on part of that uh, work in, that work this afternoon. And the title for his talk, we can see here, Slow Movements, Dance Abstraction, and Latinx Art Histories. 
Dr. Roberto Tejada is perhaps familiar to uh, many of us here in the, Williams, in the Williamstown area because he spent, um, I hope, what was a very productive year as a Clark Oakley fellow in the past. He's the author of the um, newly released Still Nowhere in an Empty Vastness, a cultural poetics on the imagination borderlands of the Americas. He's also the author of National Camera, Photography in Mexico's Image Environment, published in 20. Uh, 29, 2009, and also in 2009, his monograph on the artist Celia Alvarez Munoz was published as part of the AVER Revisioning Art History Series launched by the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA. He is a Hugh Roy and Lily Krantz Colon Distinguished Professor in Creative Writing and Art History at the University of Houston. The title of his paper is Latinx Poetics in the Future Imperfect. Adriana Zavala is associate professor at Tufts University, where she teaches modern and contemporary US Latinx and Latin American art history. And in some ways, um, you know, when we think about these kind of networks and kinships and constellations, I hope you won't mind this too much. I think, uh, Adriana, I think of us as kind of analogs to one another in our, in our own institutions and, and, and Roberto as well as kind of Latinx specialists teaching within graduate programs that are, that are, that are that are master's programs, right, specifically, something that you, you spoke about earlier, too. Um, she's the founding director of the U.S. Latinx Art Forum, or USLOF, and her current research project, Unsettling Brown and Black, explores a way that Latinx visual artists engage with the legacies of franchise and settler colonialism across the Americas. Dr. Zavala has curated several exhibitions, including Frida Kahlo, Art, Garden, and Life at the New York Botanical Garden in 2015, that was accompanied by the beautiful publication, Frida Kahlo's Garden, that was published by Prestel. Her 2010 book, Becoming Modern, Becoming Tradition, Women, Gender, and Representation in Mexican Art, won the uh, RV Prize from the Association of Latin American Art, or ALA, in 2011. And the title of her, pa of her paper is Invisible, with a kind of, you know, uh, parentheses around the in, invisible, visible, in, right, invisible, to whom? And uh, Mari Rodriguez Binney, um, our, um, our delightful and amazing and inspiring colleague in art history here at Williams, will serve as a respondent and moderator. Mari is uh, assistant professor of art history at Williams, specializing in modern and contemporary Latin American art. And her book project um, focuses on neo avant garde experimentation uh, with new technologies in print media in 1970s Sao Paulo. So please help me in welcoming all of our speakers and specifically Ramon up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Andine and Marco Antonio and everybody else that had some work to do to make us all come here. I saw a cow, I'm happy, I'm excited uh, to get the work started. And I'm gonna time myself so that I don't go over. Slope Movements, Dance Abstractionism, and Latinx Art Histories. I'm going to make an argument for the inclusion of dance and movement within the scholarly and curatorial pursuits of Latinx art history. I do so with an understanding that not a single exhibition or art historical account of Latinx art, and I'm talking surveys here, has ever given movement-based practices the light of day. <laughs> And I do so as a scholar whose pursuit of Latinx aesthetics originated from the discipline of art history, and for whom movement and dance has not only become a significant object of study, but an analytic for historicizing, interpreting, and theorizing Latinx cultural practice. It is not the first time I enter a discussion about the direction of Latinx art with an argument about dance and movement. 24 years ago, it was the work of one of our conveners today, Professor Andin Chavoya, uh, that first invoked for me the relationship between the visual arts and movement. Encountering through his work at the University of Rochester, Ascos, oh sorry, this is not it, um, Ascos 1972, uh, Walking Mural, at a time when art historical accounts were invested in the dematerialization of the art object in US American conceptualism, and that created a dissonance from the, um, for me between what I under, understood to be a visual studies theorization of the performative as a distancing from the materiality of the object and what I felt as performances gifting to me of the materiality of the body. 
That is, in the impermanence of the visual object enacted by Asko's irreverent volumetric rendition of monumental painting, I encounter the emergence of a brown body to Parsos Esteban Muñoz's conceptualization of brown feeling in motion. The conceptual gesture elevating the visual slightly uh, into abstraction, but returning through the body in motion back into the recognizable, yet not quite identitarian, or to think with Laura's beautiful opening keynote last night, a different way of knowing and doing subjectivity in the realm of Chicanidad, or what so would soon become Latinidad in the rising disciplinary formation of Latinx studies. Almost 17 years ago, we gathered at the Smithsonian Institution for a conference on the representation and interpretation of Latino cultures. The event brought together distinguished, a distinguished cohort of Latinx scholars, activists, curators, and museum professionals, on Dean included, to examine the state of the field, especially as it concerned the documentation and archiving of Latinx art and expressive cultures. In my presentation, I ponder upon our kinesthetic histories tending to my ethnographic um, fieldwork um, into Latinx social and experimental dance practices and communities and my collaborations with the late curator Marvet Perez into the archives of Latinx musical history, including dance. And I argued for the ways dance contain invaluable historical data, if slightly elusive in its formal rendition, about our place in the world and our enactment of purposeful and pleasurable strategies of becoming ignored in most collections of Latinx art and culture. At the time, my intervention sought to put the body on the line as a grounding gesture into the materiality of Latinidad at a time when the Latinx explosion narrative had begun to circulate hyped up choreographies across global commercial screens. While my anxiety over the Latinx explosion speeding up of Latinx choreographies through emphasis on consumable spectacle and portable and translatable entertainment packages no longer drives my interest, I have not retired from my insistence that we ought to engage with our kinesthetic cultural resources in advancing truly comprehensive understanding of Latinx aesthetics. It remains a point of frustration that in 2019, I still crave for that yet to arrive substantial embrace of movement in the discussion of Latinx art. So I turn back to the intersection between visual and kinesthetic renditions of Latinidad in order to mine the aesthetic practices of movement as frameworks that in turn recast the visual towards a different sensorial experience and political possibility. This project first took me, and that's where the pictures needed to be first. Uh, this project first took me back to the Latinx queer nightlife spaces where I pursued the anachronistic aesthetics and slow gestural repertoires of Latinx drag queens like the late Miss Ketty Kianga listed here, uh, image here at Chicago's legendary La Cueva, the oldest trans uh, Latina drag bar in the United States. This at a time when RuPaul's Drag Race ushered sped up fast succession competition drag that has become both aesthetic standard and the cookie cutter model for a niche industry sponsored by marquee um, alcoholic drink brands or leisure gay travel brands. So here I was interested in the ways old queens in exquisite sequin, sequin gowns critically altered this dynamic and intimate bolero scenes that slowed down the nightclub crowds into moments of contemplation, pedagogy, and choreographic resource sharing to think along the lines of Jonathan Ballin and Fiona Buckland and other folks in dance studies who have looked at this um, as, a, as a space for articulating different aesthetic resources for the quotidian. The Latinx aesthetics of heartbreak music and its accompanying gestural flourishes in melodramatic amplification decelerated the club's dynamics in support of indulgent collective emotional depth, slowing down to get down to the business of contemplating a history of gesture as collective world making, a kinesthetic ethics of spectatorship as embodied mutuality. More recently, I have been preoccupied with movement as an expansive analytic, grounded but far exceeding dance. And I want to think of this turn towards movement as a reevaluation of Latinx aesthetics um, in choreographic terms. So more specifically, I have been turning to the aesthetics of reggaeton as a way to access choreographic practices that move this musical cultural platform to feminist and queer ends. 
But in doing so, I'm also invested in exploring the ways in which movement introduces a critical level of abstraction that holds world-making capacities for Latinidad without losing its material coordinates. Reggaeton time or the times of reggaeton. On June 12, 2016, as the New York Times reported, hundreds of partiers were bringing their best to the dance floor as the reggaeton beats emanated from the DJ booth. As revelers swayed to the music, a 29-year-old security guard entered the Latino queer nightclub in Orlando, Florida, and carried out one of the deadliest single gunman mass shootings in the history of the United States. On June 12, 2017, one year after the Pulse Massacre, countless commemorative dance and music streaming services included Luis Fonsi and Daddy Yankee's global hit, Despacito, as the latest reggaeton song to animate queer choreographies on the Latino dance floor. As Despacito rode the mainstream of US American pop culture atop the Billboard Hot 100 chart, record-breaking YouTube views and rapid-fire circulation in live and mediated performances worldwide. Queer Latinos took to the dance floor in Orlando, New York, San Juan, Santo Domingo, Havana, and many other such centers of Latino Caribbean queer nightlife to both memorialize those lost a year prior and perform the resilient wisdom and pleasures of queer dance as a practice of what performance scholar David Roman has termed dance liberation. It is in this resurgence of reggaeton as a global popular soundscape, a second round of reggaeton's 2005 breakthrough as the then second wave of the Latin explosion, and, it, and its more recent slower, queerer rendition in Latin trap, what serves as the background sounds of what we may periodize um, now as the post Maria Puerto Rico. And we are then in the time, if not necessarily in the despacito tempo of reggaeton. So today I want to highlight aesthetic techniques drawn from Latino queer feminists and uh, queer social worlds, but invested in formal frameworks of abstractions and conceptualism in contemporary art. The two examples that I introduce intervene visual economies of Puerto Ricanness through choreographic abstractionism. It is generally understood that blackness grounds the sexual potentiality of reggaeton. And I want to argue that its rendition in abstract form in contemporary experimental visual and performance art through choreography anchors the feminism and queer optics that interest me. In moving away from purely sociological renditions of reggaeton in the realist representational form characteristic of most scholarly treatments of the genre to date, I joined, the, I joined the scholarly conversation of queer aesthetics and abstractions sustained by the likes of literary scholar Philip Bryan Harper and art historian David Getze. Like them, I tend to the specificities of form, gesture, duration, effort, shape, to identify blackness and queerness across artistic platforms that render them abstract but sensorially palpable categories, able to animate desire across Latino and queer spectatorial positions. And like them, I see taking on of abstraction as propositional of alternative forms and life worlds. However, while Harper bypasses performance, especially jazz in his move to advance a Brechtian distancing from realism argument about narrative. I turn to movement and dance as a communicative platform that, always are, that is always already oriented towards abstraction while depending on the material present of real bodies. So turning to aesthetic abstraction pushes the frameworks of the popular in reggaeton into the platforms of the experimental. And here, it's worth returning to a quick a key question posed by John Noriega. Did I do something here? I did. Oh, there we go. Um, by, by John Noriega in, in, in talking about the work of ASCO and, and the questions their work initially awakened for me many years ago, present, presencing Undine talk about their work in Rochester, New York. So what does the avant-garde look like and sound like when it blooms outside the hothouse of the bourgeoisie? What does social protest against racism look and sound like when articulated outside a realist code? For Chicano working class avant-garde group, race in the barrio assimilated to American mass culture and making discourse the object of its social protest, the answer is simple. It looks like both and neither. It sounds the same, but different, end quote. In turning to Latinx practices in experimental dance, I want to demonstrate what movement might introduce, 
who are discussions of Latinx aesthetics. And I want to briefly then turn to the work of two artists, Awilda Sterling Dupre, now in her 70s and active in Puerto Rico, and Nivia Pastrana Santiago, now in her early 30s, active in Puerto Rico and featured in this year's Whitney Biennial. And what I want to do is explore um, specifically the interest through slowness and stillness. <laughs> I'm gonna let her keep playing while I talk. So Wilda Sterling Dupre's Reggaeton Lento from 2008 responds to the question of reggaeton's gendered politics by making it an object of black feminist aesthetic pursuit and pleasure. In this piece, Sterling slows down, segments, and abstracts the component parts of reggaeton choreography. She begins her routine moving to Tego Calderon's Loisa, a strong critical statement on Puerto Rico's race problem, in, uh, introducing his 2003 hit album El Avallarde. Calderon offers one of the most sophisticated and apologetically black and political articulations of the genre while remaining a participant of its mainstream platforms and networks. He has also been especially committed to showcasing a continuance in form and content between reggaeton and other Afro-Puerto Rican musical traditions. Here he states a similar concern with Sterling. Uh, he has Sterling Dupre's own trajectory as a dancer who wants to work between traditional Afro-Puerto Rican forms and avant-garde performance on the island and its diaspora. Loisa, of course, is an anthem about a real place, the mangrove lands and beachfront region east of Isla Verde where African Maroons settled in their escape, initially from plantation economies that dominated around the northern and northeastern lowlands and eventually displaced from the growing urbanized core of San Juan. It is also a critique of the political economy of blackness in Puerto Rico. The town of Loisa today remains an iconic destination for tourists, internal and external alike, looking to savor the blackness of the island, if you will, what many scholars have labeled as the folkloric blackness um, of Puerto Rico. But it is also a profound, um, a proud community of Afro-descendants, Puerto Rican, and more recently Dominican and Haitian, who have found in this town a legacy of resistant living and an acknowledgement and social choreography of black struggle. That is, Loisa balances between a tourist-friendly front um, that sustains some of its economy and a suspicious and protective backstage infrastructure an effective orientation that understands its historical and present precarity, its vulnerability before developers, and its legacy of violent and traumatic repression by government authorities. These are the mixed feelings mining reggaeton's social protest song and its corresponding and widely circulated music video. Sterling Dupre's slow dance matches and indulges in Calderon's refrain that ando sin prisa pero tu lentitud me coleriza. I am not in a hurry, but your slowness enrages me. If in Calderon's song, slowness is about the lack of progress in the representation of black pain and political economic marginalization, in Sterling's dance it becomes both a dwelling in the exercise of critical frustration and a contemplative intervention in the gender politics of reggaeton and its gendered racial politics more specifically. For Calderon's important politicizing of reggaeton's black subjects in relation to the broader material and symbolic struggles of Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico's racial arguments, his terms of engagement with the politics of race center exclusively a male subject. Sterling Dupre, Sterling Dupre sorry, takes on the racial critique articulated in Calderon's original. And what did I do, Ramon? Okay, here it is. And transposes it onto the body of a mature black woman. In slowing down, she also refocuses reggaeton choreography from simple objectification of the overexposed semi-nude juvenile video dancer onto the agentive weighted down but still erotically charged black dancer in the live theater space. 
Her slowdown is a breakdown, an indulgent presentation of the thinking black female body, not in light contemplative mode, but in articulate deconstructive mode. As the dance progresses, the music stops, and she begins to vocalize, oje, oje, which translates as, hey, or listen. And this call for attention, this, hey, listen, is a demand in conjunction with Calderon's call to speed things up, to get things right, but also an invitation to observe carefully with regard, with commitment, to the absences of a genre and a politics that this dancer claims for herself with commitment, uh, for herself that she chooses to put her body into, and a black feminist call for a justice to be re reached not from surface engagements, but from substantive adjustments and reparations. It, is, it also diverts the visual consumption of the black dancer into the other sensorial registers of movement and sound. But it is also a statement of the pleasurable investments in a black aesthetics that evidences, much like Calderon himself proclaims, that ni sufriendo dejamos de ser felices, not even while suffering do we stop being happy. Slow rubbing against the statuary of power. I want to close with Nivia Pastrana Santiago's 2014 performance and photo series, Los Presidentes Pisan, o Conmemorando lo Invisible, o Quiero Ser un Iconoclasta Sexy. <laughs> the presidents step on, or commemorating the invisible, or I want to be a se sexy iconoclast. In this photographic series, Pastrana brings reggaeton choreographies to the monumental Paseo de los Presidentes, a statuary behind the Capitol building commemorating each of the eight presidents of the United States who have set foot on Puerto Rico. She dances against the statues in perreo motion, mocking the solemn posturing of the life-size statues and rehearsing to its feminist undoing the iconic images of the Mujer Patria. Here, choreographic choice is rendering photographic shots that abstract an affixed movement into still fragments of the presidential statues at the colonial outpost. So if Despacito's 2017 breakthrough represented a, trans, a, a transitional slowing down and even softening of reggaeton, after all, Luis Fonsi's credentials were primarily as a soft pop act, and a transitional bridge from the Latin, to the Latin trap platform so queerly assumed by Bad Bunny recently, Awilda Sterling Dupre and Nivia Pastrana were already intervening and derailing the visual economy of the genre by creating choreographically abstract interventions into reggaeton gesture and putting bodies in all their thickness onto the screen and print visual, print visual frameworks of the video screen or the photographic still. And it is in these choreographic procedures into the visual culture where I see a space for Latinx art history, a Latinx art history that embraces dance, not with the anxious askings to stereotype that characterize my initial ventures into the Latin exposure, but with understanding of the series and articulate aesthetic tradition that movement has introduced to an art, art archive. This is a new art history. I hope you're willing to move towards not so despacito. Thank you. Antonio Flores, and on Dean Chavoya, Williams College and the Clark. It seems like this is a conversation, a continued conversation with colleagues, some of whom are here, and through sites of exchange like Latino Art Now that was in Houston this year, uh, the United States Latinx Forum that Adriana Zavala directs. And what I'm going to talk about today are also questions and poses questions that probably belong to the realm of what I would call poetics and gatherings like the recent Poetry Studies Now or Thinking Its Presence that were convoked by one of Williams College's own uh, faculty, Dorothy Wong. So by poetics, I guess a shorthand, I could, we could call it something like the research imagination, but it's also this idea of how to make a body of knowledge foreign to itself while finding a home for whatever it is that the di discipline, let's call it art history, will become in that encounter. 
The development of art by Latinx makers and its complexities in matters of aesthetic alignment, geographic location, cultural heritage, historical viewpoint, and the varieties of embodied life give way as well to questions of artistic identity and media format. I have in mind practitioners with dual commitments to the making of objects and actions, as well as to the language arts and its encroachment into the visual and performative. To the degree that some writers have developed their craft external to the framework of one literary community or another, likewise has poetic activity thrived outside the places historically consigned to provide the genre its authority. To complicate the difference between maker and words made, a challenge crucial to any contemporary writing defined by a critical standpoint, we can pursue a storyline that accounts for Latinx poetries as through the lens of exceptions to the imagined norm. My intervention is modest. I want to bring attention to voicings and visuality in Latinx art, to the way these particulars open up identities and forms of personhood, sometimes elusive to more strictly art historical research imaginations. Talk piece writer performer David Anton reminded us that from the mid-1960s to the early 1970s, conceptual artist Vito Conchi initially belonged to a loose network of experimental writers before abandoning poetry for the art world. Conchi's example is the reminder, too, of a largely unexplored poetic archive, a genealogy of experimental writing by Latinx makers sometimes eclipsed by their art practice more broadly understood. Relevant to Latinx art and actions is the poetic imagination of conceptual artists that have continued the line of inquiry prompted by Duchamp and subsequent art collectives like Fluxus, Art and Language, and Asco. Often uniting both the documentary, fictional, and theoretical impulse, these tactics deploy linguistic enactments whose bearings on the visual field and poetic address is hardly incidental, as in the case of poet Seshu Foster and artist photographer Arturo Ernesto Romo Santillano. In this collaboration, connected to Seshu Foster's ongoing East LA walking tour platform, an interview with an apocryphal Juan Fish allows writer and photographer to create a speculative fiction that transfigures the difference between what is true and what is not true which, quote, is not anywhere as important as the similarities. To ensure pages of text and photographic image in interview with Juan Fish, parentheses, supposedly, and in such questions as, what is the purpose of mystery? What is the purpose of death? Analogies between word and picture so unravel the mysteries of East LA as to make the ordinary extraordinary. What is the purpose of ball lighting around General Hospital, especially on winter nights? Juan Fish, I'm not really familiar with anything like that. So I don't know. I did hear there used to be a Zeppelin landing pads on top of the building, where they would anchor the Zeppelins to a lightning rod they used to have up there. That they planned this whole other lighter than air patient delivery to avoid street congestion on the ground. But that was when they used to plan things like that and have alternative ideas about how to make the city better. But I don't know what happened to that. Maybe those ideas went out with the red cars or even before that. Although Foster and Romo Santillano contribute to a long tradition aligned more squarely with the conceptual frame of the photo book, perhaps, one need only recall that foundational, a foundational text for Chicanx Latinx letters, Jose Montoya's El Louis, was crafted by a multimedia practitioner who early bridged the division between word and image through his interconnected identities as printmaker, poster artist, and as a member of the Royal Chicano Air Force uh, Collective. Composing the plane of Jose Montoya's Calendario 77 is a September 1977 calendar page with abbreviations for each day of the week in Spanish, initials of the Royal Chicano Air Force, RCFC, a sharp yellow ground incorporating deep red and blue volumes, and a front page section of the Los Angeles Herald Examiner dated June 1st of 1943, with headlines that betray public media expressions of white supremacy. 
telescoping from World War II to the present in an anti-Asian and anti-Mexican American racism. The print's formal and thematic reporting points back to the bebop phrases that inflect the bilingual vitality of the poetic voice and the aspirational style of the deceased and lamented antihero in Montoya's 1970 elegy, El Louis. Louis hit on the idea in those days for tailor-made drapes, unique idea porque Fowler no era nada como Los Ol El Paso Texas. Fresno's West Side was as close as we ever got to the big time. But we had Louis and the Palomar, El Boogie, Los Mambos y Cuatro Suspiros del Alma. Montoya's visual and poetic practice together form a critical association that coaxes participants into the circumstance of art's legibility by upsetting the customary categories of knowledge, by underlining the dubious stability of particular containers, the poster is printed matter in the public sphere, for example, rhymed and reiterated in the situational personality of meaning. So too, Harry Gamboa Jr. in his parallel identities as maker who employs the media photography, performance, video, installation, and poetic writing has produced a range of work that remains critical to an understanding not only of canonical Chicano, Chicana art and its history, but also to more accurate depiction of the avant-garde as per the wake of minimalism in the United States. His writings as texts, however, are rarely discussed within the frame of present-day Latinx art and performance. This is hardly surprising in so much as his work consistently discredits accepted categories, creating innovative alternatives to re reveal histories otherwise rendered invisible by dominant cultural institutions and media industries. By turns dryly humorous, eerily, dream eerily dreamlike, and always startling, Gamboa Jr.'s art and poetic practice critique urban life forms and the idiosyncratic cultural nexus of Los Angeles during the last decades of the millennium and after. Referring at once to the city's seismological instability and its demographic transformations, Gamboa Jr. describes Los Angeles as environmental and social landscapes in recurrent flux. In interviews and lectures, he remarks how LA neighborhoods transfigure in terms of cultural, economic, or racial composition, how freeways were built to carve up and designate particular areas, and how control and surveillance gave way to the historical social isolation of East LA. Even as the city experienced civil uprisings in the 1960s, until the 1970 Chicano moratorium in East LA, that part of the city had remained largely off the city's self-imagined grid. The urban infrastructure provided limited arteries, among them the recently removed Sixth Street Bridge, facilitating access to East LA, as Rito Gonzalez uh, described today. Gamboa Jr.'s writing, in conjunction with, a, an in, in conjunction with and independent of ASCO, mirror the, quote, freeway map ontologies of Southern California identified by cultural historian Mike Davis when he showed that, quote, while established black and Chicano neighborhoods were losing several thousand housing units a year to freeway construction, non-Anglos were able to purchase only 3.3% of the new housing stock constructed during the 1950s boom. Gamboa Jr.'s poetry voices the resulting segregation, social alienations, and the, quote, car culture phenomenologies of urban life dedicated dictated by the automotive and aerospace industries across multiple locations of Los Angeles, as well as the mental geographies that betray class prejudice in Southern California and the Baja California borderlands. His poem, Opposing Fast Lanes, builds on the momentum of, quote, inequality that approaches at lethal speeds when someone from the other side dares, breaches the wall, slams head on, disintegrates beneath restlessly spinning wheels, crushed beyond recognition, no better for the wear and tear. Life moves at 70 miles per hour. I glance out to the unknown faces that whiz by, they on their fast lane, going backwards to continue their story. The brief encounters with each face highlight the dangers of cultural collision. I fail to merge into obscurity. 
Opposing fast lanes serves as a fable about the liabilities of cultural encounter for subjects, quote, from the other side in an accelerated cityscape established by narrow definitions of belonging. In language resembling delayed detonated bombs, that's Gamboa Jr. himself, Gamboa Jr. stages the collision of voices particular to the Boyle Heights vicinity and the collusion of language with the theatricality of everyday life in East LA. Motivated by a drive to figure everyone and everywhere disguised as nothing, the poet's brand of Boyle Heights surrealism, or barrio baroque, aims often to expand or refute the proprietary nature of the self. Especially telling is the aptly titled Deleted to Meet You, whose persona is in possession of five forged passports rubber stamped to death. I had been everyone, everywhere disguised as nothing. Rumors surfaced in Guadalajara, Berlin, Montebello, credited me with the bombing of suicide bridges, the discoverer of latent lovers, the assassination of a border guard. It must be com comforting to count the worms crawling out my brittle face, an opaque landscape of anonymity, distorted by the certainty of infinity. The dissolution of identity is what you'll write on the blank postcard that was my life. With its ever-shifting and therefore uncontainable speaker, at once credited with bombing, discovery, and assassination, Gamboa Jr.'s poem stages the forms by which representation is inclined to determine social identities while jointly permitting the poetic self to be an actor in the making of history. This agency in the processes of history and representation further attains in Gamboa Jr.'s understanding of the stage a style of theater that eschewed professional actors and rehearsal time, with performers offer, often handed the text while the audience was still seated and the curtain was down. We do a run through, he says, lift up the curtains and hope for the best. Enactment and self-fashioning similarly inform Gamboa, Gamboa Jr.'s photographic series, Chicano Male Unbonded. His resolve to configure an anatomy of Chicanx or Chicanx masculinities and to establish an archive of its particular iterations regardless of the sitter's gender representation or object choice. Employing a visual schema in which each portrait aims to defy type and foreground exception, in 1944, Gamboa Jr. asked poet and performer Roberto Bedoya to pose for a photograph. At the time, Bedoya had already participated in various art communities among them the San Francisco writers associated with the new narrative. He had been the first persona of color, he had been the first person of color to serve as director of the avant-garde multimedia art center, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, LACE, submitting his resignation after seven months due to, quote, philosophical differences with board members resistant to his vision of equity and inclusion. At the time, Gamboa Jr. made this portrait Bedoya was now a producer of cultural programming for the Getty Research Institute for the History of Art and the Humanities. Gamboa Jr. was inspired to create this portrait by a performance piece Bedoya had created with fellow artist Daniel Joseph Martinez at the Santa Monica Museum of Art. Lampooning NPR's syndicated car talk radio format, the two artists sat on stage behind a desk piled high with art books immortalizing the Western canon while the audience was encouraged to submit objects for appraisal or to otherwise pose questions to the ersatz authorities. The parody derided the exclusionary art world establishment by conflating aesthetics with mechanics and expertise with entertainment. Bedoya's trickster rasquache attitude led him to improvise an outfit for the performance in, quote, a kind of punk queer cantinflas drag. Improvisation and the playfully unscripted animate the Chicano male unbonded series. Almost all of the images are photographed at night, almost always in a kind of space deemed potentially dangerous, suggested by location and available light sources, and using high-speed film. Gamboa Jr. has remarked, I used a wide-angle lens. There's an implied vanishing point, both physical and psychological, end quote. 
With such a wide angle lens, if the subject isn't properly centered, the body becomes distorted. In the study of many sided masculinities, intergenerational and gender fluid compositional elements, the upright figure and disfigured surroundings, are meant to mirror the desire, fear, and loathing common to representations of Chicanx subjects in the media. A more expansive field of meaning for these photographs is available, available through the voicing that moves parallel to these images in Gamboa's poems, as well as in rehearsals of the artistic work and cultural contribution of the photographic subject that led to the portrait in question. This method can underline the way in which, together, poetic word and image making gain the unceasing power to frustrate conceptual assumptions about an obligatory relation between the picture's producer and the pictures produced. Gamboa Jr. creates honorific scenes for the varieties of Chicanx masculinity while creating a space in excess of those signs that by symbolic implication point to a necessary subject. What he would call in his poem, an opaque landscape of anonymity distorted by the certainty of infinity, the dissolution of identity. Um, I have, looking at this, a uh, portrait by Jack Vargas, I couldn't help but think of Andin Chavoya's Axis Mundo. And I would, just thought as a thought experiment what it would look like to make Jack Vargas's wonderful poem text, The New Bourgeois I Want with Gay Male Suggestiveness, the kind of center of a kind of thick description of that exhibition and the kind of curatorial decisions that Andin made. And I think centering that text would be uh, reflective of lines like, I want to have intelligent people over. I want them to notice. I want them to be impressed. I want to be impressive. I want to make an impression. A kind of whole world of personhood seems to animate that and the possibilities that are, that are and the relationships that Andine, Andine sets up in that exhibition. But I want to end by turning to the work of Jennifer Tamayo, a queer, formerly undocumented, Latinx, oh, excuse me. Uh, punchline. I turn to the work of Jennifer Tamayo, a queer, formerly undocumented Latinx writer and performer. For Latin Art Now 2019 and Countercurrents 2019, both in Houston, Tamayo further developed a multi platform and multi part intervention, existing in iterations on the page and in the visuality of poetry as performance, wherein transposed voice and the performer's body multiply as sites of corporeal histories, media critique, identitarian loss of bearing, but also ancestral knowledge prone to ask questions about the violent legacies of slavery and settler colonialism that haunt the present and the specificity of place. The body examined is also multi-part, the artist's own, as figured in language and in relation to Nickelodeon's television animated cartoon figure, Dora the Explorer. In an artist statement, Tamayo writes that if Nickelodeon's Dora the Explorer was perhaps a whitened fantasy of late 1990s Latin explosion, or an effective recuperation of Cuban migrant Elian Gonzalez snatched back into the arms of US empire, or the digital production of deracinated Pan Latinidad ready-made for mass consumption, then my various performance poetry projects loosely titled La Queeradora take on the digital properties of hyperlinks, glitching, and memeing to develop a poetics of annotation that critiques Dora the Explorer's enduring participation in the embodiment and deployment of global white supremacy as an infectious vi virtual corpo reality." End quote. In the poet's book-length work, You Do One of 2015 and 2017, a print-based performance or theater of voices, what Della Pollock terms performing writing, Tamayo creates an immersive textual space in typography that provides a harrowing, excessive, and deranging glimpse into the internet unconscious, celebrity, delirium, rape culture, and the immigrant condition, but also an agonizing account of family trauma, a father-daughter interface or reckoning, immigrant narratives of return, in this case to Colombia, and textual orchestrations of melancholy, sarcasm, and fury. 
The book serves as a time-based and visual performance about the desire for access and world-making, inaugural scenes, embodied actions, and about unacknowledged depth, depths, chiefly the frame of performance that prompts an affect in motion, with its turn, with, which in turn drives commitments between visual and vocal imaginations. Um, I want to turn now, I'll just show these. In, a, in this alternative universe, a critical space of enactments existing simultaneously on the printed page and in performance space in La Quiradora now, Dora's antithesis is the symbolic weapon of law, the phallus of white supremacy. She writes, this white cock sets into motion a complex system of analogies that connects the surveillance state, the capitalist machine, demanding fuel in the form of labor, laboring immigrant bodies to the Stephen Sondheim, Leonard Bernstein musical West Side Story. It transposes Freud's 1905 case study, fragments of an analysis of a case of hysteria onto the Dream Act of 2011, or vice versa, at any rate, onto a queer or subordinated de desiring subject in tyrannical nightmares of dominion over precarious or destitute life. I won't read this poem, but it begins just with, I won't lie, the white cock sometimes, I want to crush hearts, I want to stomp out all the love in the hearts, splatter crusts, and so forth, and ends then with this re reference to West Side Story, I want to live in America, everything great in America, I, I, I. In the Houston County... In the Houston countercurrent iteration of this work and as a prelude to the performance proper of La Cuidadora, Tamayo participated in one of 10 tiny dances performed by various solo artists or duets in the queer space of Houston's LGBTQ plus disco riches. This nightclub, in this nightclub, Dora, she swayed reggaeton to reggaeton and cumbia while wielding this and finally destroying this white phallus while taking swigs of bottle from a bottle of Colombian aguardiente. In text form and the system of analogies that unite Dora the Explorer to Anna Mendieta, Ida Bauer, the Dora of Sigmund Freud's case study, and to the myth of El Dorado and the language of maternal indebtedness, there's one section in which Tamayo substitutes the name of Freud and other identifying terms with the characters of Dora, Boots, Diego, and Swiper in an appropriation of Dora, an analysis of the case study uh, by, a, by a scholar named Alan, Alex Gatlin. But past the half mark of Tamayo's 40 minute performance, the artist so disrobes from Dora's explorer drag into black lingerie as to conflate Madonna's 1984 iconic pop song, Borderline, with Gloria Ansaldua's La Frontera. The shifts in tone then are abrupt as the news feed on social media, now intimate, now laughable, now sinister. I'm not gonna read this either and move forward to, the, to my concluding remarks. The 40-minute version of Tamayo's La Curadora led artists and audience to such syllables that would oblige a kind of physicality, a high metabolism, a gesture language in the locations of mass media derangement or in the obscene underbelly of unwanted thoughts in a future imperfect. By future imperfect, I have in mind the view of speculative writer and novelist William Gibson when he says the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. In practices like those of Tamayo and others, the materiality on the page and its concomitant voicings are critical limitrophe spaces of poetry and art capable of energizing alternate political and geopolitical locations, borderland eventualities, and hemispheric desires often staged across landscapes residual to the original brutality and theft of colonial settlement. A Latinx cultural poetics I have in mind appeals to the future imperfect rehearsed in imaginative failures to disavow the hemisphere's violent underside of history. It is a work in progress currently enlivened by a generation of multiracial, queer, and gender fluid artists and activists crafting pathways for discussing the, the X in Latinx. Poet and scholar Alan Pelais Lopez cautions that Latinx is not for everyone. Transgender 
and gender non-conforming Latin Americans living in the US have used the X as a reminder that their bodies are still experiencing colonization, invested in disciplining them to fit a standard of gender identity, gender presentation, sexual orientation, and a particular sexual performance. For Palais, Lopez, and for poet performers like Jennifer Tamayo, the X is a scar that exposes four wounds that Palais Lopez nominates as being <clears throat> the legacies and, hist and histories of settlement, anti-blackness, femicides, and inarticulation. The cultural poetics obtains per this cultural poetics obtains personas in the research imag imagination made possible by those artists for whom pattern language and speech so rekindle in the tangible present as to coalesce into the voice Michel de Certeau described as moving through an intermediary zone between body and language, strange interval where the voice gives speech without truths and proximity of presence without possession. This presence without possession is to ask what it means to engage an advanced language of public imperative. A Latinx poetics can bring together works as those that may suggest that in our embodied political identities, the visual and the vocal are apt to coincide, but more likely to endure as mutually dissolving ostensible selfhoods. Here, La Cuidadora intones provisional parting words. All right, uh, I'll just read them. <laughs> These days I'm into negativity, like being less than, like being zero, like the possibility of zero to be so lacking it burns holes on all it touches. I imagine myself scorching, zero, deflated, effervescence, a halo. I believe in the power of nothing because first, fuck power, and second, could I coronate myself with a glowing nothing, I would do it forever. I am beautiful in the space of nothing in which I burn, the cavity of me outlined in pink droopy leaflets scorched from the inside out. Don't touch me, I'm nothing. That nothing is neither a disintegration nor a vanishing. The zero circles back to enliven Latinx personhoods, a vocal, visual, and embodied collage to power the imagination, the underground place where, as Gloria Ansaldúa once insisted, the possibility of uniting all that is separate can happen and make happen. Thanks. echo the thanks that my colleagues have already extended um, to uh, Andine Chavoya and Marco Antonio Flores for inviting us to be here. And I want to thank my colleagues for their presentations and the audience for being here to think about future directions. So as the last to present in future directions in US Latinx art, um, I want to acknowledge my colleagues for bringing to light rich, provocative, complex art and art history of the US Latinx community. Um, their scholarship offers irrefutable evidence that Latinx artists, be they Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex, Puerto Rican, New Yorican, Afro-Boricua, queer, Indo-Latinx, Dominican-American, Quisque York, Afro-Dominican, Cuban diaspora, Blacksican, Salvadoran-American, et cetera, and so forth, have always engaged with, mastered, and complicated the aesthetic and conceptual currents of mainstream, now global, contemporary art. The papers presented here have shown why and how Latinx art is American art. Yet I venture to say that many of the artists discussed in this symposium are less, if at all, familiar to those in the audience who do not specialize in Latinx art histories. While I will, sh I will shortly offer my own art historical contribution, I want to begin with some st statistics that illuminate why our cultural production remains marginalized while the violence against our communities is daily in the news. So I begin with a number, 50,223. And this number was the New York Times number of the week on April 25th of 2019. It's the number of immigrants in ICE detention as of Monday, April 22nd. It's the entire population of the city that I live in, Medford, Massachusetts. And it's one of the highest numbers of detainees on record to date. And I'll underscore that the, the vast majority of detainees come from Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, followed by Haiti. I also want to acknowledge that these individuals, these human beings, are being held all over the country as part of the prison industrial complex. There are more than 200 immigrant prisons and jails in the United States. 
And I've identified these just because they represent the states where we, the scholars who presented today and yesterday, reside. Um, so I won't read the names of the detention facilities, um, but I, I want to mark that, that uh, we are and they are everywhere all around us. In terms of statistics, and I mentioned this already earlier, um, I think one of the issues about visibility and visibility relates to the number of scholars who have dedicated themselves across disciplines to teaching the history of US Latinx art. And my colleague, Rose Salceda, who's a new assistant professor at Stanford, and I have been compiling names and statistics for a couple of years now. And there are 31 scholars across the entire United States who dedicate themselves to teaching this um, at the university level. And this is a cross field. So art, in art history, American studies, anthropology, film studies, English, ethnic studies, Chicano Latino, gender studies, and performance studies. That's a remarkably small number. I also want to mark the number of faculty teaching Latinx arts histories in departments with PhD programs. There are only 19 faculty. And then in the field of art history, which is the field that I was trained in, there are only 10 faculty who robustly dedicate themselves to Latinx art history, and only six of them teach in PhD programs, and four of us teach in MA programs. So recently, I'm sure many of you heard about the Mellon study that was about the demographic survey of museum staff, and the fact that only 3% of museum leaders identify as white Hispanic, and it's not insignificant that they not only identified as Hispanic, but they identified as white, because the very few that there are are predominantly white Latinos. Um, and then I want to mark the fact that I think at, at this count there are only nine museums with curators specializing in US, U.S. Latinx art in the United States. And there are LACMA, VPAM, Whitney, Smithsonian American Art Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, the Perez Art Museum, El Museo, MFA Houston, and the Bronx Museum. So that might not seem like a low number, nine, but when you think about all the museums in this country, that's a remarkably small number of institutions. Um, and then I've also been tracking the number of doctoral dissertations in art history because I really feel that art history is one of the sites that most egregiously neglects uh, the histories of communities of color. So I've been tracking the pipeline flow of doctoral students researching U.S. Latinx art. So over a period of 15 years, um, working from the College Art Association's Dissertation Index online, I, I counted the number of people who were working on the art of the United States, on Latin American art, which is a field that has exploded in the last 25 years, and then U.S. Latinx. And you'll see that over a 15-year period, there were 498 dissertations on the art of the United States, 161 on Latin American art history, and only 16 on U.S. Latinx in art history. And then for the last year that's available right now, which is 2017, there were 165 dissertations in progress on the art of the United States, 63 on Latin America, and only 13 on U.S. Latinx art. So I think, that, I think these numbers really bring to the fore um, the invisibility of, of these histories. But I'll move on from that to my own art historical intervention, invisible to whom? So a bald eagle lies motionless on the gallery floor, talons bent and rigid, wings pulled in, pathetic yet protective. The eagle's neck oddly bent is suggestive of a tragic fall. What of our national emblem of bravery, freedom, honor? Cast in bronze and weighing several hundred pounds, the eagle signifies the United States on the 243rd anniversary of its founding as a republic in 1776. Behind the eagle on the gallery wall are inscribed 243 dates. On a nearby bench, a booklet includes corresponding texts contributed on invitation by 243 Americans who, as artists Adriana Coral and Vincent Valdez explain, have, quote, unique perspectives on being American. Artists, prison inmates, activists, teachers, those without homes, immigrants, healers, store cashiers, Buddhists, journalists, civil servants, nurses, historians, yard workers, custodians, human rights attorneys, soldiers, close quote. The texts submitted include, for example, the Papal Intercaetera of 1493, granting Spain and Portugal the right to colonize, convert, and enslave. A passage from the Fourth Declaration from the Lacandon Jungle in Chiapas, Mexico, issued by the EZLN, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, in 1996, that states, quote, we want a world in which many worlds fit. The nation that we construct is one where all communities and languages fit, where all steps may walk, where all may have laughter, where all may live the dawn, close quote. And other texts describe collective and individualized instances of political awakening. And of course, this work is now on view at Mass MoCA. 
It was through the burning of the paper upon which were inscribed the 243 texts and dates that the patina for the bronze eagle was achieved. In this way, the artists state, quote, Requiem is an American eulogy, a token remembrance toward the recognition of people who carry with them daily the broken promises of words like peace, life, liberty, hope, equality, justice, and freedom, close quote. At the public unveiling of Requiem on April 13th, Valdez and Corral led a procession that included a group of black-clad black pallbearers who carried the eagle into the gallery while a Tejano sextet played mournful songs in the manner of a New Orleans funeral. In the age of Trump, with white supremacy uncomfortably uncomfor out in the open, Corral and Valdez explained that Requiem is, quote, a reminder that someone's privilege might be at someone else's expense. In response, they have created a history for the people, by the people, close quote. In the gallery exhibited alongside Requiem are hung a series of monumental black and white oil portraits comprising Valdez's 2018 Dream Baby Dream. The portraits depict speakers at the June 2016 funeral of American boxer Muhammad Ali. They attest to the message of unity, peace, and brotherhood espoused by Ali following his conversion to Islam. They comprise We the People by depicting as diverse a group of Americans as one might find. But to dream baby dream seemed to Valdez nearly impossible in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election. The portrait series is part two of the painter's The Beginning is Near, which began with a monumental portrait of white supremacy as part of our American everyday. What does it mean to be American and black, Muslim, LGBTQ+, Native American, Asian American, or Latino, Latina, Latinx? What does it mean to be American, whatever your race, ethnicity, or social class, if you recognize that the terror that American fascism is perpetuating daily since 2016 against Im immigrants and black lives is in truth not fundamentally new, but is part of the warp and weft of American history? In her 2018 site-specific installation, Unearthed Desenterado in Socorro, Texas, situated southeast of El Paso on the U.S.-Mexico border, Corral honors the memory of legal Mexican guest workers who, though admitted to the United States as laborers, were subjected to an insidious campaign, justify, uh, an insidious disinfection campaign justified by a pathologizing discourse that cast them as agents of contagion. It was during a residency in Berlin that Goral learned of the connection between the Nazis' use of Zyklon B, a cyanide-based pesticide, as a human extermination agent in the German concentration camps, and the same chemicals earlier used by U.S. immigration officials as a disinfecting agent on Mexican migrants in the 19-teens. What's more, the use of Zyklon B was a prelude to the practice from 1942 to 64 of fum fumigating Mexican guest workers with DDT. And of course, Rafa Esparza makes a reference to this as well in his installation at Mass MoCA. In the context of the binational guest worker agreement between the U.S. and Mexico known as the Bracero Program, Mexican braceros were publicly hailed as soldiers of production for their wartime contributions to U.S. agriculture and industry but they were also treated to humiliated, humiliating and invasive processing at sites like Socorro's Rio Vista Farm, where Coral staged a North Desenterado. More than 80,000 braceros passed through Rio Vista Farm annually between 1951 and 64. Their testimonials highlight the humiliating experience of being processed at Rio Vista, including oral exams, chest x-rays, and blood tests, as well as musculoskeletal inspections often performed by Texas growers themselves, not unlike buyer's inspections of chattel slaves in the antebellum period. As historian David Dorado Romo notes, little if any information has been collected on the lasting effects of the Bracero's exposure to DDT. By unearthing this history, Coral's installation invited the public to meditate not just on the historical, but the contemporary implications of discourse that pathologizes immigrants. As installed on site in the spring of 2018, Unearthed Desenterado featured a solitary 60-foot flagpole hoisting a large white cotton flag measuring 18 by 30 feet. The flag was manufactured in San Antonio of white cotton in reference to the surrounding cotton fields. In addition, given the harsh winds, Coral knew that the cotton flag would unravel over time. Embroidered on one side of the flag was an image of the Mexican eagle, and on the other, an American bald eagle, emblems of each nation's patriotism. Historically, the flags of both countries flew at Rio Vista in the approximate location where Coral's flag was hoisted. And I don't know if I can get this to work, but I'm going to attempt. 
As it fluttered in the strong winds, the flag's imagery suggested that the eagle's talons locked were caught in a struggle. As Corral has stated, Mexican laborers are a part of the very fabric of this country. Along with others unrecognized, their work provides fabrics in the textile industry, food on dinner tables, they construct our cities, serve in our militaries, work in our factories, and serve as nannies raising American children. The violence, but also the generative possibilities of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands are explored in powerful and poetic ways as well in the work of Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. Recognized for her weaving and textile-based multimedia art, Jimenez Underwood has developed a formidable body of work engaging border imagery, walls, flags, as well as other themes. And I want to mark that our colleague, Laura Perez, as was noted yesterday, is editing the go-to source on Jimenez Underwood's career. So I think I'm very eager for that book to come out. Jimenez Underwood was raised in California to a Chicana mother and a Huichol Indian father who were migrant laborers. Although she was the first in her family to complete high school, she earned an MFA in 1987. The materials she's, she employs in her art attest equally to a contemporary sensibility, an acute attention to craft, and keen awareness of the borderlands, literally and metaphorically, as a landscape that connects as much as it divides people and communities. Her weavings include all manner of vibrantly colored hand-spun threads and precious metal wire, as well as barbed wire, safety pins, and plastic bags, to which she adds embroidery, silkscreen, and painted elements all inventively combined to create a large-scale fiber art that is inspired, she states, quote, in equal measure by land, politics, and spirit. Not unlike Coral's white flag, One Nation Underground, which you see on your left, combines the flags of the U.S. and Mexico to suggest ideological collision. The geopolitical border is articulated by barbed wire running on the diagonal, the delicacy of which belies its materiality. Yet the vertical and horizontal lines created by a tight, multi-hued pattern of chain-stitched embroidery attest, as the artist states, that living in the borderlands, flags become similar, blurred, both nations seem the same, close quote. Home of the Brave includes abstracted elements of several flags, including red and white stripes, and large square and rectangular sections of blue, red, black, and white. The bottom edge of the flag includes sections of traditional indigenous woven cloth. These elements combine to suggest not just her identity as an American of Mexican descent, but her identity as an indigenous woman with, her with a heritage connection to native textile traditions. Once again, the barbed wire border traverses the flag on the diagonal, while in the center, a barbed wire circle contains three renditions of a caution sign depicting a family of running migrants. Such signs became familiar markers on the U.S.-Mexico border in Southern California in the 1980s. But here the image is silk screened onto delicate floral swatches of fabric that dangle from chains of tiny gold safety pins. While evoking containment, as well as the terror and power dynamics of the borderlands, from a distance, the circle of barbed wire is also suggestive of a crown of thorns or a Native American dream catcher. I want to acknowledge, as I said, that Dr. Perez is editing an anthology on this remarkable artist's work. And there's much more to say about Jimenez Underwood's art. In the interest of time, I'll propose that her appropriation of flag imagery can productively be considered along alongside similar work by Brooklyn-born Puerto Rican artist Juan Sanchez. Over the course of his 40-year career, Sanchez has dedicated himself to making dynamic assemblages that combine expressionist painting, collage, photography, text, and graphics. His aesthetics of juxtaposition and superimposition were honed during his MFA at the Mason Gross School of Art at Rutgers University, and then under mentorship of Leon Golob, Melvin Edwards, and Robert Blackburn. His multivalent visual codes give voice to the Puerto Rican community's long history of political disenfranchisement and social marginalization, while exploring as well the complexities of Puerto Rican, Black, and Latinx identities through montages of American pop culture, Catholic and Afri African religious icons, Taino petroglyphs, historical figures of importance to Puerto Ricans and Latinos, and intimate references to family. His triptych, Donde Esta Mi Casa, Where Is My Home, interrogates Puerto Rico's neocolonial status. The central panel is dominated by two Puerto Rican flags that appear mounted on the facade of a New York tenement. The flag's political potency relates to its history. It combines the revolutionary flag of Lares, designed as a symbol of the independence movement in 1868, 
with the flag adopted by Cuba when that island successfully won its independence from the US in 1902. The Puerto Rican flag is all the more politically charged because it was a felony to fly the flag on the island from 1898 when the island was invaded by US forces and became a US possession until 1952 when the island became a commonwealth or free state associated to the United States. The flag was officially adopted as the flag of the Commonwealth in 1952, but the blue of the isosceles triangle was darkened to match the navy blue of the US flag. The flag's co-optation as a symbol of the island's Commonwealth status remains in perpetual collision with memory of the flag as a symbol of the island's independence movements. These unreconciled struggles are referenced in Donde Esta Mi Casa. Across three panels, a collage of photographs includes a repeated image of protesters with fists raised and photographs of two New York City protest posters dating to the 1970s. One in solidarity with the island's independence struggle. The second in Spanish says, awaken Boricua and defend what is yours. Layered over this imagery are scrawled graffiti-like phrases in Spanish asking, where is my home? Where is my country? Where are we going? On the right in English is written, Bullets and bombs aren't the only way to kill people. Rotten buildings and garbage and disease kill our people. AIDS kills our people. Though created in 1990, the constancy of the political sentiments in Donde Esta Mi Casa is expressed by the inverted palm trees, which bring to mind the destruction left in the wake of Hurricane Maria in 2017, devastation that is ongoing still today. Like Jimenez Underwood, Sanchez's use of flag imagery bears consideration in light of the conceptual and formal work that the US flag has afforded other artists like Faith Ringgold and Jasper Johns. Johns once stated that as a quote image the mind already knows, the flag allowed him room to work on other levels. I suggest that flags allow Coral, Jimenez Underwood, and Sanchez to do particular kinds of work as well. Like John's, Sanche, Coral, Sanchez, and Jimenez Underwood's flag works are aesthetically and conceptually innovative. Like Ringgold's flag works, they are politically trenchant as well. And in Sanchez's case, not least, because unlike the American flag, the political valence of the Puerto Rican flag invites viewers to ex excavate histories that so few Americans have ever been taught. Evidenced, for example, by the fact that in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, nearly half of Americans polled were unaware that Puerto Ricans have been American citizens since 1917. I've elected to highlight these artists today because they exemplify the conceptual rigor and formal range of Latinx art. They hail from Texas, California, and New York. Each identifies with particular communities, mobilizing that heritage in the service of decolonial praxis. Each artist renders visible, in infinitely creative ways, how prejudice and discrimination persist, how ignorance serves to obscure the contours of Latinx histories, the complexity of who Latinx people are, and our contributions to the United States. Prejudice and discrimination relegate us to the margins, yet frame us as imminent threat. Like other people of color in the US, Latinx lives are made fungible and the Latinx community's value is circumscribed by an economic, political, and cultural system structured by the principles of racial capitalism. Coupling political scientist and black Marxist Cedric Robinson's assertion that capitalism is always racial capitalism, to Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano's explication of the axial relationship between the coloniality of power, racial difference, and modernity, helps me to understand how even in the best of times, never mind these times, the US deploys multicultural terms of inclusion in ways that value and devalue forms of humanity differentially to fit the needs of reigning state capital orders. Whether under Clinton, Bush, Obama, or Trump, Latinx people have been visible mainly as migrants or laborers, sometimes as a voting bloc with the potential to sway elections, as the Hispanic market share, and when convenient, our culture is co-opted, reduced to tacos, salsa, and Frida Kahlo. Latinx artists such as those I've highlighted and the ones that my, my colleagues have talked about push back not just against the terms of inclusion. Crucially, their work invites viewers to reflect on the deep structures of historical amnesia, and they invite us to envision, as both Ramon and Roberto have shown so beautifully in their presentations, they invite us to envision futures otherwise. For me, Latinx is not a pan-ethnic label. 
Rather, it is a political concept and a critical analytic, grounded in the decolonial turn and informed by the troubling realities of our contemporary moment. Widespread complacency in the face of increasingly fascist nationalist political discourse that openly flaunt xenophobia, sanctions white supremacist violence against and misinformation about people of color, and is un unapologetically linked to capitalist expansion. Its victims are pathologized, forgotten, or hidden from view beneath a bridge or within the prison industrial complex. But Latinx art invites us to confront the historical roots and contemporary manifestations of this violence. It invites us to reflect upon the temporal duration and spatial extension of the conditions that made the death of two children and truth of countless others in detention camps in the United States in December of 2018 possible. Thus, I, get, I dedicate this talk to the memory of Jacqueline Ame Rosemary Calmaquin and Felipe Gomez Alonso, two Guatemalan children aged seven and eight who died while in the custody of US Border Patrol agents on December 8th in El Paso and on December 24th in Alamogordo. Both children's families originate in the Maya highlands of Guatemala, where endemic violence traces back decades, not least to the US Cold War interventions and decades of civil war not to mention to U.S. grown gangs that have spread across Central America since the 90s. And today, indigenous peasants are being driven off their lands by the sugar and biofuel agro in industry, which in turn is wrecking environmental devastation that further impacts their traditional life ways. Returning to Requiem, these are the conditions that it invites us to consider. Against a backdrop of historical amnesia, discrimination, and ignorance, can we in the academy envision and strive for a future in which we no longer need to argue emphatically that Latina, Latino, Latinx art is American art, or that these stories are part of American history? The struggle against inequality is at the heart of Latinx art. So why the X? First and foremost, the X signifies a refusal of gender binaries. LGBTQ plus communities are foundational to the conceptualization and affirmation of the X in Latinx. The X is thus, to, thus about queering knowledge in the most radical and capacious sense. It is about simultaneity, as Dr. Perez um, shared yesterday. It refuses separability, particularly of race and gender, and it reveals what is not seen, in the words of Maria Lugones. It marks structured absence. It also marks that we are present and demand to be counted. The X is about a politics and poetics of relation. In the words of Dr. Tomasi Barafrausto, it is a puente, a bridge to other historically marginalized communities and voices. As the work of Adriana Coral, Vincent Valdez, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, and Juan Sanchez, and so many other talented artists show, Latinx art is rooted in Gloria Anzaldúa's border thinking, Jose Esteban Muñoz's disidentification, Edward Glissant's poetics of archipelagic relation, Walter Mignolo's epistemic disobedience, Chela Sandoval's oppositional consciousness, and Tomás Ibarra Frausto's rascuachismo. In other words, Latinx art demands critical thinking about the ways we know, and the fact that the structures and methodologies we have inherited from art history's origins in the European Enlightenment are not natural or incontrovertible, but are instead situated knowledges within which the arts and cultures of subordinated communities are diminished and relegated to less than. The artists I've highlighted are all contemporary American artists. They employ cross-cutting decolonial imaginaries to confront and delink from the matrices of power comprising colonialism, imperialism, and nationalism, racial capitalism, modernity, liberal democracy, and even multiculturalism. Their complex aesthetics demonstrate a mastery of the terms of art qua art, but their poetics also exemplify invention as a political act. Their works render visible people and stories that dominant accounts of history and art have rendered invisible, and they affirm that while we may be invisible to many, we are not invisible to ourselves or to each other. To conclude, last month at the sixth annual, at the sixth Latino Art Now conference, Dr. Tomas Ibarra Frausto encouraged the Latinx generation to go beyond kith and kin, in a word, to be cosmopolitan. Intersectionality is the ultimate form of cosmopolitanism. Dr. Ibarra Frausto also urged confianza, conocimiento, and convivencia. That is to say, mutual reciprocity, trust, confidence, intimacy, understanding, harmonious coexistence, and intercultural sharing. But we must demand that our confianza, conocimiento, and convivencia be met on equal terms. If we must know your culture, these times require that you know ours. Mutuality asks that we know one another's stories, recognizing shared experiences and relations of colonization, racialization, and immigration. 
If you aren't familiar with Dr. Ibarra Frausto's work, he's a visionary thinker, as visionary as Oquium Weezer, John Berger, Lucy Lepard, Michael Baxendahl, or T.J. Clark. He elaborated the concept of rasquachismo, which he defined as a brash underdog sensibility rooted in working class consciousness. More attitude than style to be rasquache is to subvert and turn ruling paradigms upside down. It's a make-do sensibility of resilience, juxtaposition, and integration. I offer thus that the X in Latin X is fundamentally rasquache. Thank you. Thank you. If I could have the speakers please join me on the stage. Thank you all very much. It's a, truly an honor to share the stage with you all. Um, and I, I wanted to start by echoing the sentiment that has been said already a number of times. Uh, but I think it is important to underscore this um, over and over. And that is precisely the particular potential of uh, a Latinx art history in transforming art history at large as a discipline uh, because precisely of its interdisciplinarity. And uh, because it prompts us to uh, look at the spaces that such uh, interconnections open. And the three of you beautifully bring forward the, the richness of the archives that are animated precisely by looking at these uh, liminal or limitroph spaces, you borrow a term from um, Roberto. And Ramon, just to, to uh, give a, a recap of sorts, to, I, I think it's a really beautiful term that you open up in terms of uh, opening our discipline to consider kinesthetically. Uh, the body in movement, and, and not just any body, but brown and black bodies. And, and, and considering uh, these choreographically abstract interventions um, into the visual and having this as a, as a framework for us, I think it's important uh, for us to vitally consider the responses and the redirections to local and, and globally circulated cultural resources. Uh, but also to have art history be capacious enough to register the, the political possibilities of such works. Um, Roberto also to, to, uh, in, to echo also to make art history capacious in, in the sense of considering in tandem uh, voicing and visuality. Um, and, and not only because it's disrupts the codified boundaries that are in our discipline, uh, but also because they allow us to consider in a much more nuanced way how we marshal our cultural resources in our public political imperative um, as artists and also as art historians. And Adriana also to the, the, the possibilities and richness of revealing, of artists revealing and unearthing hidden narratives. Uh, but also, I think uh, that I think is really beautiful in your paper is, is considering the varying forms of this historical excavation um, and, and a reorientation. So not just archival uh, research and accumulation, but also uh, in terms of the use of craft, for example. And I guess the, the first question that I wanted to start with is that uh, in looking at the three papers in, in tandem, um, I'm seeing how importantly Latinx artists uh, in their decolonial practice are engaging different temporalities. And uh, on the one hand, we have an unearthing and an excavating. And then we also have uh, world making of choreographic abstraction, for example, or the imaginative failures, um, as you say, Roberto. And I'm wondering if you could each talk a bit more um, about perhaps in the case studies that you discuss, but also the corpus of works that you discuss at large in your practices, um, about this, what I see is a productive tension between these modes of confronting and revealing. So on the one hand of, of disclosing, but then of also 
opening up to eventuality or to these spaces of excess, um, to borrow another term. Um, so I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> well, it, may, it might be easiest for me to just begin in terms of the, the veiling and the unveiling. I mean, one of the, one of the moods or attitudes I'd like to see in the way that we describe certain works, and of course I'm drawn to works in which there is a creative tension or pull between a, a discursive mode and a performative mode or a visual mode, because I, I mean, I really do think that what gets lost if in, in a purely sort of empirical or aerial view of the kind of art history that Latinx artists can produce is that the kind of embeddedness and situation, the, situa the situatedness of the way that practice works. So, for example, um, Rita Gonzalez talked about Raquel Gutierrez, who is a, I would describe her as a cultural journalist who's also doing art history insofar as she travels with, it's kind of a thick description, traveling and working alongside someone like uh, Rafa Esparza and you, you get a sense of what the practice is actually like of making those uh, adobe bricks through this thick description. So to me, the, this is where the kind of what gets lost or what's veiled by a purely um, expository account can be enhanced or amplified through parallel domains, be they kind of rep reportage or ethnographic writings that will give a kind of uh, fullness or, or breath to, to what, would, what would be lost by the, just the visual account. That's the excess, I think. The excess is, is, is what we're always trying, there's that which is an excess of itself, but still is lacking something in the, in the way uh, we need to describe when the works beg to be described. I think, I mean, I, I agree with you and want to echo that in terms of kind of our, our set methodologies, right? We're so driven by the project of interpretation um, in, in, in a very object-based form. It's how we're trained to look at, in art historical ways. And thinking ethnographically, thinking across, processually, a, a, as you do, thinking about not just the material, but, but the labor uh, that goes along it, as you so beautifully demonstrated in your own paper, I think it, it just introduces a, a kind of regard for the practices that are central to Latinx art history that is also in other forms of, of understanding process in, across the art historical canon, but it, that it's really at the core of how we approach materiality in, in, our, in our field, right? That the aesthetics of labor as execution unravels is, is to the core of, of, of even the stillest of our images, right? Um, and, and that I think being able to, to more substantially uh, introduce that in, into both our training and, and the core theorization of what it is that it constitutes um, our field is, is where I see the kind of transformational provocation that we also offer um, the broader field of art history and other humanities. Um, that are driven by a kind of myopic uh, methodology of interpretation. Um, so, you know, I think that expansiveness also accounts for the kind of excesses that at times are critical uh, directionality announces, but that I take really seriously as the gift that I think many of my colleagues demonstrated uh, today in terms of how they regard these practices. Yeah, I would add that you know, there, there were two reasons that I wanted to start with Adriana and Vincent's work, and one is that it's here, and I want everyone to go and see it. But it's also that, um, and in, in no way do I take credit for this, but I met them two years ago in Boston when they were passing through town. I'd met them at the Ford Foundation, and we sat and had coffee one rainy afternoon in Boston, and it was as they were beginning to conceptualize Requiem. So in a larger piece, larger piece of writing, I, I, I whether it'll make it into the book, but I wanted to. I think about what it was to sit in New England in a city that often feels very inhospitable to me with two up-and-coming artists of color grappling with what they wanted this piece Requiem to be 
in a New England city. Like that's all a part of it, right? And so ethnography is really important because I don't want to just stand outside the object. I feel so privileged to just have been a fly on the wall. You know, and then to act, and, and so I texted Adriana yesterday when I was sitting at Mass Mocha, and, she's, and she said, I remember the rainy afternoon in Boston. So I simply say that to say that that, that, inf that is informing the work I'm doing now in a way that's radically different than the work I did in my previous part of my career. It's this sense of convivencia. So I was so struck at Lan. Um, when Roberto and Josh Franco sat with Tomas Ibarra Frausto and Amalia Mesa Baines was supposed to be there and she couldn't be there. And you so beautifully brought to the fore how important her contribution was. And you know, it, it could have been such a rich conversation just talking with Dr. Ibarra Frausto, but, but she was brought, her spirit was brought into the space. And to me, that's really what I, why I feel so passionate about Latinx art history, is that it's about convivencia and, and about community and about the artists and bringing that forward. One of the other things that Tomas Ibarra Frausto mentioned that at that discussion, which was uh, incredibly rich and, and, and um, astonishing to watch a thinker at, uh, at such a senior thinker, thinker really uh, grappling with the present which, and trying to understand new generations. But he also came up with another methodology that, that, uh, that I think is something that worth considering in which he wanted to, and this was part of the idea of having Amalia Mesa Baines and Tomas Ibarra Frasto speak to each other, was really uh, to underline this idea of kinship and friendships, mm -hmm. but also as Tomas mentioned, the idea of chisme, or anecdote, yeah. and, and really the anecdote as a, as a really theoretical concept, as Benjamin describes, which is that the, the anecdote brings the present into the, bring, excuse me, the, the anecdote brings the past into the present to the scale of the human, right? Which, so, and that's to answer sort of your question about uh, temporalities. A Latinx art history, even in the present, what might be considered uh, the historical present, where do you begin? If so many of these works are pointing to the violent foundations of the Americas, do you begin there or do you begin in the present? Do you move back and forth? So this kind of temporality is, is it's a kind of, it's a dialectic which is, um, and kind of a, a, a kind of paradox of terms which is a kind of uh, a longed for past. You wanna change the past and the present and you wanna rem remember a future that may or may not ever come to pass. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of uh, tension, it demands a, another way of, of storytelling. And I, and I think there's something to that, uh, you know, and, and you speak well to the directionalities of it. And I'm also interested in these broader dynamics in the sense that your numbers, I kept thinking, I was like, how many artists are producing within like contemporaneously, mm -hmm. and 30 people are producing criticism, yeah. right? And, and to think about the slowness of the output to catch up with the amount of cultural practice um, that is in circulation, right? And the fact that, you know, and, and, and the hunger that there is for that conviviencia that you announce, right? So, so, so there's this pull to speed because there's this wanting and this urgency of accounting for so much and at the same time, the capacity, uh, you know, of a, uh, the stretched out capacity of a very small group of very busy people, right? And, and, and that dynamic, that other temporal dimension to, to the relationship between art production and criticism and documentation in, in our field is really critical to consider, especially next to uh, other perhaps ethnically specific fields that have been able to build capacity much faster, right, and much more efficiently because there has been a kind of investment, sometimes out of guilt, sometimes out of demand from academic institutions to catch up. We're still not getting, we're, we're getting the work done and acknowledged, but we're not getting the positions, we're not getting the ability to train more people to meet capacity of the work. Absolutely. I want to make sure that we have time for questions from the audience. Um, we can't really see, so. <laughs> Maybe? Oh, wow, okay. Uh, my name's Alejandro. I'm a sophomore at the college and undergraduate student. Um, thank you for the wonderful, wonderful lectures. 
Um, beautiful presentations. Um, my question is kind of along the line of, of the, that last statement of sort of building capacity. How do you get to a point where you can train in order to keep up with the work that is being produced? Right? There's a big conversation on campus at the moment with um, concerns um, amongst students of color on how we, A, get the college to hire mm -hmm. faculty of color and then to retain faculty of color. Um, and <clears throat> I guess it's sort of getting at this question of how do you then face a sort of institutional side behind that? And once the idea of right, the number of the 30, um, the 31 in the country, faculty currently imagining that uh, right, undergraduate, graduate students are going to be the ones filling those roles, how do you then sort of bring the students into that kind of a space, right? Sort of this lineage of, you know, into that graduate program that I'm in class right now with Professor Rodriguez Bini, um, and the few of us that are sort of Latino art focused art historians, or I guess maybe rising art historians, um, we're all in her class. Um, and there's maybe a handful of us. Um, where's everyone else? And how do you then sort of continue that, build that capacity? <laughs> it's, it, you're asking a, a big question of the moment, for sure, and we look at uh, the recent news of ethnic studies at Yale University, you look at the recent news uh, in Latinx studies at Northwestern University, you, leak, you know, like most of these institutions, um, you know, are being pushed by student activism, and that's crucially important. Uh, Faculty alone do not get these changes to happen. It's the students who are the butts in seats, who are the primary presence and life of the intellectual exchange of the university that make any of this a possibility, right? And I think that's, that's important. So continue to push your institution, including Williams College, to meet those demands for the kinds of needs that it's arriving population, but also that the field needs in order to be a viable field, right? I think that's critically important. The other thing is, in, and in the morning, I'm not sure if you were here in the morning, but there was a lot of conversation um, from fabul our fabulous divas of the museum institutions um, uh, about kinship and pipelines and networks, right? And how crucially important they are in that context, and, and for us, they're just as critical. And, and crucial to, to, to the viability of things happening. My own personal history has been only possible because I happened to have arrived at the University of Rochester when Laura Perez was a first year postdoctoral fellow, Anandine was a graduate student, and I just happened to be a freshman in college who ran into that conversation and had, you know, and was perverted from pursuing <laughs> a medical school education. Uh, <laughs> to look into other things, right? And I think that, that kind of world-making, life-changing possibility needs to be the right of many of our black, brown, indigenous folks coming up the pipeline. So, so I think it's, it's serious business to demand for those positions. So I can't give you a solution, but I can only encourage you to keep pushing and try to persuade your institution to meet those needs. Yeah, I would echo that. I think students really have a, a great deal of power and I think thinking simultaneously, thinking intersectionally and thinking about the meanwhile. So I think it's, it's really significant that we're all here in this corner of Massachusetts, you know, props to, to, to Dr. Chavoya and Marco Antonio for, for bringing this together and for the Clark to hosting us. But um, and it's amazing that you have two faculty who are in, in, in one university that are interested in this. But don't take that for granted and insist in your other courses that faculty strive to attend to the meanwhile. And if they're not able to do it to meanwhile histories, you know, while this was happening, that was happening. Bring that into the classroom. Create a cognitive map. And you know, depending on the faculty member, be diplomatic about it, but say, okay, so if this was happening in Europe in the 18th century, if these altarpieces were being gilded with gold, where was that gold coming from? And what is that history, right? Because we all can only do so much. And so I do want to be generous to my colleagues that they can't know all the histories, but if you know them, bring them up. Right, so students, I think, and at Tufts, that's how change has happened. I mean, we were very late to the party of having Africana studies. And so, as my dear colleague now at Yale has articulated, Lisa, Lisa Lowe, 
we had the, the, the latecomer's advantage. And her notion of intimacies, in her book, The Intimacies of Work, uh, everyone has to read that book. Because this is all about entangled colonialism, right? And the coloniality of power. So if you're sitting in an art history class where this, this isn't the, the subject, help to make it, shepherd it into being the subject, if you can. And I know that puts the onus on students of color. I'm, I'm super sensitive to that. Hi, thank you for all of your, your essays. Uh, Ramon, I had a question about the, the Bad Bunny music video called Gato. I don't know if you've seen that one. That one's being praised for its gender nonconformity and this kind of second generation of reggaetoneros that are kind of being praised, but almost to the woke bay syndrome where Evie Queen is kind of calling J Balvin and Unwell out that these kind of lyrics that are challenging masculinity she's been doing for since the first generation. So I was just wondering about your perspective on that. That's a really, that, that's a great question. Let me tell you one thing that I've had to do in my project, I'm not, pursuing the reggaeton makers themselves, although Bad Bunny created a lot of trouble for this book, and I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of the kind of aesthetic categories or strategies that was, I was outlining from visual, experimental dance artists, performance artists, um, and media makers around reggaeton, around deceleration, around weightedness, around all, all these kinds of strategies that I saw as intervening the genre to queer and feminist ends. At the very beginning of the, of the thinking around a kind of almost binaristic framework of here's the commercial popular culture, here's the kind of experimental rendition of it to queer ends, has been completely flipped in the context of Bad Bunny in the sense that he is doing the visual articulation that I was seeing somebody like Carolina Caicedo doing in Rincón in the early 2000s in a video project called El Gran Repetón, Perretón. Um, so, so Bad Bunny kind of has decelerated my own writing in completing these revisions in the sense that I think you're, you're right that, that he has become the kind of repository to all of this queer desire and possibility. Um, under the assumption, and, and I have to say, I give him partial credit in the sense that he, while initially a little bit shy about entering that space, has become, uh, if not without complication, a kind of queer advocate, ally slash troublemaker, um, kind of undoing a bit of what that mainstream platform, which has been much more, I mean, historically, aggressively homophobic, right? Um, and I think in, in some ways, I, the softness of his aesthetics in dress, in speed, in, 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 in lyrical content and so on, um, has opened new possibilities, I think. So initially, uh, this book ended with a reading of uh, René Pérez, um, piece about the birth of humanity. I don't know if you've seen that video um, where humanity cracks, an egg cracks, a black woman gives birth to los anormales. And it's all kinds of um, strange figures um, in a way, in ways where strangeness and queerness um, align with a, still with a kind of cis normativity that, that was a bit predictable, if you will. And, and, and so it, it, I ended kind of after spending a whole book saying, oh, look at all these things that reggaeton animated, uh, seeing, but look how queerness returns to the commercial platform of reggaeton, and it becomes this problematic thing all over again. So the form gets, uh, enters the commercial pipeline and gets destroyed again. And Bad Bunny leaves me at a different place now, so I'm having to go back and have a second conclusion to this manuscript now um, that, that moves beyond the reggaeton moment into the Latin trap moment as a way of saying that there's a kind of more hopeful possible end there, not, not without resolution or, or without giving absolute heroic status to a figure uh, like Bad Bunny, but saying that you know there's something with more potential going on there, I think. So, so I have to, 
I have to go back and, you know, it's, so instead of ending with a visual artist or a performance artist in the traditional kind of gallery sense, I'm ending with Bad Bunny as this popular culture figure <laughs> that carries all these aesthetics back into, into public view. Without forgetting that Rene also went to art school and is thinking through and trained to uh, work from very similar kind of aesthetic categories and techniques as well. It strikes me also that this, the, the mode of the, of the slide lecture, the PowerPoint, is also the ways in which, as scholars or writers, that we can both advocate for certain artists. I mean, I, I'm thinking of yours, Avidana, for example, showing the kind of hard data about the field, but then going into a, a very deep, the aesthetic and a deep reading that somehow the, the data looks very different once you've gone through a deep, a deep reading of a particular body of, of work, right? Um, and that, and that um, it, not need, it need not only circulate in, in essay or book form, but that, the, that we, ha we are performers as well in a sense, and that these are opportunities to advocate for the kinds of questions about faculty and so forth. Yeah, thank you, and, and that, was, that was my aim, is to sort of say, you know, I'm going to give you some hard statistics that are startling and depressing. And I think your point about the number of cultural producers that 31 people have to catch up with, I, you know, I, I couldn't even count the number of artists, particularly if I include the kinesthetic. I mean, there's thousands, right? And, um, but I think also in this political moment, you know, that throws into relief why this matters, right? Because these artists have been doing this work for decades, and politics change. You know, I was talking to Rocio about the sort of politics of immigration in the 80s and, and how those compare to what's happening now. 30 years from now, what will we be saying about this generation? People like Guadalupe Maravilla or Vincent and Adriana, or looking back to Juan Sanchez, who's been excavating the flag. You know, I mean, he's not gotten his due. And suddenly there seems to be quite a bit of interest in his work, and I think it's because, again, the moment is now to think about the implications of that flag and, and all of its meanings, right? And, and the same with Jimenez Underwood. So um, I think you're right. I think that the value of the performative for us is important too because it allows us to sort of throw things into juxtaposition in, in provocative ways. And it, it somewhat answers this very, you know, troubling question, which is about slowness. To what degree, on the one hand, there's a need to accelerate because there's an, a field that's expanding, but on the other hand, there's the there's the risk of flattening the work if it if the if the speed is incommensurate with the depth of the work, right? So slowness is really a kind of also a, a, it's an ethos of of what kind of what kind of writing do we want? What kind of platforms can we, can we provide? Especially when we're invoking this acompañamiento as a critical framework for how we navigate our field, right? In the sense that if you think about Tomasa and Amalia, right, you see about it's also duration, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and, and, and that kind of the sustainability of that effort uh, is what, you know, is why this, you know, we need to think about adding some people into this mix. <laughs> it's a lot of weight to carry. I believe we have time for one or two more questions. Oh. Well, I really, really enjoy the panel. And uh, it has been a wonderful day. And it was uh, incredible the way we have all engaged since last night with Laura, and, and events like these are important because we get to share and to get to know each other. And uh, although I, I do cultural studies and Latino studies, and uh, art history has always been my interest, but what we have done in other disciplines is what we are fighting for, which is how to do Latino studies in academia. I'm from an older generation, so I'm not used to say Latinx. And uh, I, I, I wanted, in a way, to think about the flag, the trope of the flag, 
at this white supremacist moment. And while we may go to the border and see the struggle, not through art, or go to Puerto Rico and see how the flag became the national symbol, which doesn't mean independence, there are contradictions on how we iconize and ideologize the flag. And in Puerto Rico, it has happened in many ways because uh, there is a young artist that has been going in Puerto Rico from town to town to paint flags uh, on walls or stones or rocks. And he has always invited people to come with him. So it becomes a performative act itself, not of painting, but also I think about the dreamers, how you know, the argument about we cannot display the Mexican flag anymore because, you know, we got to show the American flag first. So, so those are the contradictions in a way and how, you know, it's always a political intervention in a way. Uh, and, and that's what I would like us to think about. But I like to go back to Puerto Rico. I, I feel comfortable in the border or La Mision or whatever, except Miami. And uh, uh, Ramon, uh, you talk about the paseo, but you didn't contextualize where the paseo is, why those statues are there, which is all the presidents that have been to Puerto Rico, but it's kind of a memorial uh, mall mimicking Washington, D.C., okay? And what's going to happen with Trump? Because he's the ninth president to visit the island. So what is the statehood party going to do, which is in power, about placing his, you know, his I monument? They, I think if they do build the statue, he should be holding a roll of paper <laughs> towels. You know, and then, well, and, and it'll be the one statue they allow to be desiccated, or, you know, something like that. Well, so, so I think the Paseo is right behind the Capitol building, um, which is, you know, the, the, the place of the, the center of the law as, as, as it gets legislated in Puerto Rico at a time when all powers are um, assigned to the Junta who can veto any legislation that gets produced, right? Um, they're produced, and this is the interesting thing, and now I can't remember the name of the foundry that has been producing them. But, but an article came out recently about this commercial foundry that has made millions and millions and millions of dollars on all commemorative bronzes across the island uh, and their connections to particular government sympathizers, right? So, so there's, a, there's the industry of memorialization uh, attached to particular, um, and I don't think it's Puerto Rico based, it's US based, right? Um, so I think I need to trace that. I had a note and I, I was I can't find it, but but I'll, I'll before our dinner is over, I'll give you that information. Uh, but but I think it's interesting that it's also attached to this kind of uh, commercial manufacturing venture rather than than a traditional protocol of artistic commission, right? Um, and but but I think what's interesting about you know, it's a highly policed area. There's a lot of arrests because um, they naturally become the sites of a lot of uh, interesting performative intervention, not just Nivia Pastranas, right? So both uh, by artists, conceptual, conceptual artists, but also by anybody who uses that site to exercise um, protests, right? And recently, uh, Miki Negron, for example, another queer performance artist in Puerto Rico, um, during the debates around gender education uh, in Puerto Rico, which was uh, this effort to introduce gender perspective into public education in the island, uh, religious conservative um, activists um, took to the streets behind the Capitol building and Miki Negron walked in half drag, high heels, padded, uh, shirtless with a Bible attached to his chest, poured, I don't know what if it was honey or, 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 or what else was put on the action, but he walked around 
throwing feathers into the air as he walked around um, the conservative uh, protesters and hugged them. You know, feathers from chickens from Aibonito, which is where he's from, but which is also the center of poultry, the poultry industry in Puerto Rico as, as well. So it's about, um, what's that? And the pato, exactly. So, the, so, so for one, is it's the feathers, las plumas, uh, is the way in which queerness gets designated and kind of slurs of uh, to, uh, around effeminacy, right? Uh, and that was also all of that scene, which has been highly documented uh, and theorized in Puerto Rican performance studies right now, uh, also took place in front of those precedents. So a lot of actions of protests around any legislation in Puerto Rico now occurs between the seat of law, that is the Capitol building, and the Paseo de los Presidentes, that's on the other side, along that main boulevard um, in, in San Juan. Mm -hmm. So let's continue the conversation over break. Uh, thank you all very much for your wonderful contribution. Uh, hi everyone, welcome, welcome back. Um, so thank you everyone for making time to be here. We know it's Saturday, uh, but it's it's really delightful to have everyone here. And so uh, next we'll be having um, Professor Andin Chavoya do the closing remarks, and then uh, maybe we can ask one or two questions and then move on to the reception. Um, or we can move the questions to the reception. Okay, amazing. So uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Andin Chavoya. Uh, professor Andin Chavoy is Professor of Art History and Latino-Latina Studies at Williams College. He's the author of numerous texts on Chicano avant-garde art, video, experimental cinema, and is co-editor of Chicano and Chicana Art, a critical anthology which was recently published by Duke University Press. It's amazing. I ordered it. It's great. Um, <laughs> his curate in like wonderful essays and super important essays that contextualized Chicano art and Chicano art. Um, his curatorial projects have, um, have addressed issues of uh, collaboration, experimentation, social justice, and archival practices in contemporary art. Chavoya co-curated the award-winning exhibition, Access Mundo, Queer Networks in Chicano LA, um, which will also be traveling to the Williams College Art Museum uh, this fall, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and also, uh, oh, sorry, also co-curated uh, Asco Elito the Obscure, a retrospective, 1972 through 1987, also presented at WICMA in 2012. Chavoya was recently appointed international consulting curator at the Museo de Arte de Limas, Comité de um, Acquisaciones de Arte Contemporáneo. Please, uh, please help me welcome Professor Andin Chavoya. Wow, it's a little overwhelming. Thank you, that's really so kind. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't always feel that at the Clark, to be honest. Um, so on a, thank you. Um, and a huge thank you to all of the participants for joining us here in this little corner of Massachusetts and this little corner of the art world um, for taking the time to share your wisdom and your vision with us and you know to take the time to to meet the to make the journey um, and you know as as Ramon Rivera Sivera pointed out you know there's also this is a I hope you can tell this is kind of a cohort right like we're kind of like a, a generation of scholars um, and we 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 are those scholars that are represented in the numbers that Professor Zavala shared with us right and so we are sometimes stretched out to capacity because there are um, so few of us working in this field and. Um, that makes us very busy because of our dedication to helping to, to build this field. So thank you again to all the participants and, and for all these amazing talks this afternoon. Can you please, um, you know, kind of, you know, a, a big round of applause for all the speakers. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's, it's so important. Um, for me to kind of consider what it means for us to all to come together here. And you may have noted through a series of anecdotes the kind of interconnections here um, amongst the various speakers and, and participants. And we are in many ways an informal cohort. You know, so these ideas about kinship, extended kinships over long periods of time, um, 
is something that, you know, we've all been in different types of conversations over the years uh, for different durations of time, but we rarely have the opportunity uh, to come together for this type of dialogue and exchange, which is absolutely vital. So I'm so grateful to the Clark um, for hosting us and allowing us to come together, and for, again, all the vision and ganas that, um, that Marco Antonio Flores put in, 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 in organizing this symposium. Yes. One thing that I was thinking about um, in, in relationship to um, Ramon Rivera's kind of Rivera's, uh, anecdotes about Rochester was I did want to take a moment to kind of underscore that many, if not most of us, who um, are working in the field today and that we're speaking today um, didn't have the opportunity to study Latinx art in any type of formal way um, because those courses weren't, weren't available at the time, right? The, the people um, and um, the, um, or there were very, very few instances and opportunities for that. And I just happened to be lucky enough to land at Rochester as a totally new waved out 21 year old. <laughs> <laughs> who was going to write a dissertation not on Chicano art, but on what I was calling uh, post post-colonial performance and gender dystopia in British New Wave. Uh, that's what I was. Ex <laughs> that's what I was accepted to go to graduate school to do, and um, and it just so happened that Laura Perez was there as you know, one of your first teaching positions, right? As as a postdoctoral fellow, and in the process of teaching yourself how to teach. Chicana art, right? And I'm so privileged and so blessed to have had those opportunities to study with you and to have, and, and for you to be offering those courses at those times, which is also, I mean, Professor Adriana Zavala also commented on this, on that need to teach oneself how to teach this material because many of us were trained, right, in other disciplines or, not, or even within art history in other fields within art history, right? Because there were not courses available on Chicanx and Latinx art and often even rarely Latin American art. So, um, um, and I was heartbroken when Laura left to Rochester to pursue much more interesting opportunities. Um, but I had the opportunity again, John Noriega, who was in, only in his second year of teaching at the time, was a visiting professor at Cornell University. And Rochester, Cornell, and Syracuse had a kind of scholar exchange program. So I took the Greyhound bus. I hope none of you have had to do that trip. From <laughs> Rochester to Cornell, right, to Ithaca, New York. I took the Greyhound bus, which was about six hours a day, uh, for two to three days a week to take courses with Cho Noriega at, um, at Cornell. So this is how I was able to get this training, right? But it was by total happenstance, right? Um, and just sheer luck. Because who would think that these two brilliant, formative, foundational scholars, Laura Perez and Cho Noriega, would end up in upstate New York, right? <laughs> Teaching courses on Chicana and Chicano arts. Um, and it was interesting that, you know, there were some, depending on the semester, um, my bus tickets uh, to and from Cornell would cost more than my rent in Rochester. Um, so I'm gonna try something out. I've never done anything quite like this before. We'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, I have a couple of things that I prepared that I wanna share with you. Um, so although this may indeed be the first historic gathering, the first kind of scholarly symposium organized, organized around Latinx art by an arts research institute like the Clark, it's not the first presentation of Latinx art and artists locally. There indeed, there's been a steady, if sometimes quiet, exhibition of Latinx artists at WICMA, the Williams College Museum of Art, and Mass MoCA over the years. And there is, so there's a history and a context for Latinx art in the Berkshires. And this includes a number of significant installations by artists such as Amalia Mesa Baines, who's come up several times over the past two days, and Pepon Esorio. Amalia Mesa Baines, 
had an important exhibition at the Williams College of Museum of Art in the early 1990s, Venus Envy, Chapter 2, The Harem and Other Enclosures. She has recounted to me on numerous occasions how much she enjoyed her time here at Williams, and that during the installation period, which was a really long, she was here on campus working and installing the show with students over a long period of time, she spent a lot of time with students who were involved in the four-day hunger strike in 1993 for Latina and Latino studies courses, and subsequent student activism and organizing that led to the formation of Latina and Latino studies at Williams College a program that incidentally celebrates its 15th year anniversary this weekend. And so, um, and this gathering was organized in conjunction with this quinceanera, right? With this 15 year celebration. Um, so get your party dresses out for later tonight. Um, and so it, this is the quinceanera for this first freestanding program in Latina and Latino studies in a liberal arts college in the country. Inigo Manglano Ovalle, a Williams alum, had a solo show at Mass Mocha in 2009, Gravity is a Force to be Reckoned With. And while, meanwhile, at WICMA, there was a concurrent presentation of his work, Juggernaut. Pepo Nosorio's multi sided drowned in, the, in, uh, drowned in a Glass of Water. Um, and that's, there's, a mis there's, a, there's a spelling error there that I'm embarrassed by. Um, Drowned in a Glass of Water was at the Williams College Museum of Art and also in downtown North Adams in 2010. And then there was a show that Rita Gonzalez and I co-curated, Oscar Elite of the Obscure, that came to Wickma in 2012 before traveling to Mexico City. And I do want to point out that there is a member of, an import, of this important group, OSCO, with us this afternoon, Sean Carrillo, who's in the front row. Thank you, Sean, for coming. <laughs> I think it's important to point out that this exhibition was collaboratively organized by the Williams College Museum of Art and the LA County Museum of Art. And the first museum to accept it, so to speak, the first museum to sponsor it and to give it institutional backing from which we could then apply for the necessary grants to produce the exhibition and the catalog was the Williams College Museum of Art. More recently, a panel from the AIDS Memorial Quilt for Mundo Meza by Simon Dunan was on display at WICMA in fall 2018 in conjunction with Ju Professor Julia Bryan Wilson's course, Handicraft and Contemporary, and Contemporary Art, sorry. And here's a kind of partial preliminary list of Latinx and Latin American artists that have been featured in exhibitions at Mass MoCA over the years. It's not an insignificant list. It's a serious list. But it seems that Felix Gonzalez Torres is by far the most exhibited Latinx artist in the Berkshires. And I was recently at the Latinx sessions gathering at the Perez Art Museum in Miami, as were a number of you in the room, and spoke on a panel that got, shall we say, contentious um, about considering the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres as a Latinx case study. But Felix Gonzalez Torres um, was, um, his bed billboard was featured in a 1999 Mass Smoke exhibition um, called Billboard Art on the Road, a public show organized by the museum, I think before it actually physically existed as a museum, right? And that's why it was kind of public art out in public. And a slight anecdote about this. So my first visit to Williams College was in October 1998. I was invited to give a talk um, to the art department by a dear friend and colleague, Liza Johnson, who's now a famous director and professor in the film school at UCLA. My talk was on OSCO, and I showed some billboard projects by the artist Daniel J. Martinez from the late 80s, some that he created for the European tour of the, um, of the important exhibition Les Demons des Anges, or The Demon of Angels, that featured 16 Chicano artists from Los Angeles that Rita mentioned earlier this morning. One of the curators of the billboard show, who was also an artist teaching in the art department at Williams at the time, really wanted those slides. And they were slides, like that was, the, that was the day. Really wanted those slides so that they could be considered kind of last minute for the upcoming billboard show. I asked if they might also be interested in the billboards that Martinez had made a, at the US-Mexico border or other billboard projects in the San Diego-Tijuana region by artists like Liz Sisko, Lewis Hawk, and David Avalos. I was told by this member of the art department that I now teach in that those projects were 
too regional. And I thought to myself at the time, gee whiz. Well, I might have actually used a somewhat stronger or coarser phrase. <laughs> but gee whiz, what's more regional? North Adams, Massachusetts? Or the international border between the US and Mexico? The question of the too regional or narrow casting in or from an art institutional context persists and is one of the major challenges that we face in trying to get projects off the ground. That is because far too often Latinx cultural productions and contributions are cast as regional and too regional, which is to say not national and not global or transnational. And this relates to the narrow Eurocentrism that Professor Perez elaborated on last night during the keynote address. In 2007, Felix Gonzalez Torres's Placebo was installed and exhibited again at, at, exhibited at WICMA. That semester, I designed and offered a new course on Latinx installation and site-specific art in conjunction with the installation. And in that same year, Felix Gonzalez Torres was included in Jane Simon's Mass Mocha show, Mirror, Mirror. In 2017, Felix Gonzalez Torres was once again included in Half-Life of Love at Mass Mocha. And in 2018, Felix Gonzalez Torres's untitled go-go dancing platform was featured in WICMA's exhibition, Active Ingredients, Prom Prompts, Props, and Performance. Rafa Esparza's exhibition, Staring at the Sun, curated by Marco Antonio Flores, is currently on view at Mass Mocha, as are the works by Vincent Valdez and Adriana Carell that Professor Zavala spoke of. Mass Mocha curator Susan Cross, thank you for being here, is working with Tijuana and San Diego-based artist Marco ramirez Ire for an upcoming exhibition. And the Puerto Rican artist Gamiel Rodriguez will also be showing at Mass Mocha soon. Is that one of your shows too, Susan? Yay, okay. Um, and the traveling exhibition, Access Mundo, Queer Networks in Chicano, LA, that I co-organized will open at WICMA in fall 2019. These are all things to look forward to and celebrate, but I would like to offer a little cautionary tale uh, before we ascribe to some type of triumphant exceptionalism. exceptionalism. In 2011, I wrote about this piece for the Oscar Retrospective Exhibition Catalog, and I want to dwell on it for a moment and reconsider the framework as a way to make connections to how easily it is for Latinx art to be rendered invisible. I hope it might provide a germane allegory for thinking about, quote, what are the conditions of legibility that Prof Professor Perez so provocatively and compellingly asked us to think about and problematize last night. And this is something that I've grappled with and continued to think through, yet I'm also repeatedly struck by and confounded by the still unfinished work before us. So this February 1978 issue of the Detroit Artist Monthly that you see here features the artist Ray Johnson on its cover, once deemed New York's, quote, most famous unknown artist, and includes a lengthy interview with him. Johnson is a, venerated as, quote, the father of correspondence art, a model of art making that, and distribution based on communication and exchange that he helped initiate in the late 1950s and that continues to this day. In fact, Josh Franco and Claudia Zapata, who are here with us from the Smithsonian and I, were all at a male art study day convened at the Archives of American Art this fall. This portrait of Johnson featured on the cover issue is an evocative compound or double portrait. As described in the caption, the photograph features, quote, Ray Johnson wearing an earring made from a color photo postcard, close quote. The postcard hanging from his ear features a portrait of an unnamed artist, an unnamed second artist, turned to face directly at the viewer. Thus, one artist is clearly identified as Ray Johnson, the other is not identified. The identity of the female artist is conspicuously rendered in indiscernible, obscured like an enigmatic cipher. Yet these conjoined images also function as an evocative and instructive mise en abeam for the dynamics of presence and absence, visibility and elision, documentation and erasure. The smaller portrait worn, by an, worn as an earring prominently and unmistakably features Patsy Valdez a founding member of OSCO and the group's sole female participant in the early 1970s. 
Although she had not been identified any time, at any time previously in writings on Johnson or correspondence art, even though this particular interview has been reproduced numerous times. It's a significant, well-known interview for scholars. So the image is an Oscar No movie, a single image uh, that was presented as a postcard and mailed to Johnson through the correspondence art networks. And these are a selection of Oscar No movies that were kind of mailed and shipped. These are from the collection of Robert Lambert. This is kind of how we display them in the Access Mundo exhibition. Uh, this is a collection um, on the day of the interview. Um, I'm going to skip forward. When asked about the history of correspondence art, um, Sorry. When asked about the history of correspondence, Johnson outlines the interconnected challenges these practices and materials encounter with regard to documentation. He says, there is no history. It hasn't been written. It exists as magazine articles, newspaper things, private experiences. Citing Lucy Lepard's six years, the dematerialization of the art object, an immensely important document of conceptual art as annotated chronology, as an explicit example of the elliptical history from which he was excluded, Johnson continues, it hasn't been historically or crit critically written about. It has happened, but it hasn't been analyzed or described. He portrays this scenario as a furtive cyclical paradox because the work has not been documented or recorded with in particular institutional forms and discursive modes, it's been omitted from the historical record. The evidence as traces and fragments exists in various published sources, but nevertheless remain undocumented, thus rendered potentially illegible and incomprehensible. Accordingly, this historical illegibility and analytical incomprehensibility only obfuscates future historical analyses. But if Johnson is apprehensive about his own historicization and potential elimination from the historical record, then what might be the prospects for those participants that he can't recognize, situate, or otherwise account for? For instance, Patsy Valdez and the Oscar group. And this is where kind of thinking through um, Johnson, sorry, um, uh, Johnson is, this is, these are also part of the questions of the impetus behind collecting and publishing the kind of discursive histories of Chicana and Chicano art that had previously existed as magazine articles, newspaper things, exhibition catalog essays, manifestos, artist writing, that's what motivated us and the editors of this anthology, Chona Riega, Jennifer Gonzalez, Teresito Romo, and myself, to put this book together that took over 10 years to get through Duke University Press but it's out now. Um, the Detroit Artist Monthly cover provides a persuasive model of how Oscar's work circulated, um, but it also gives us tangible example of visibility and elision. In this regard, the cover photograph indicates how such confluence and its evidence can be rendered invisible, illegible, or otherwise undocumented, even when in plain sight. This scenario is a pertinent allegory for understanding the circulation, reception, and historicization of Chicano art throughout the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s. The magazine cover further emblematizes the paradigmatic challenges involved in historicizing and interpreting these ephemeral, often fugitive art practices, while also demonstrating the necessity for further investigating, mapping out, and extending these correspondences. So, but I want to argue that these practices still continue to, um, still, can, still persist. Um, and I want to share some examples, uh, extremely mundane examples, where there is, um, that it, where this pattern is still ostensible and discernible. It's a concrete example of the way things are unread, erased, and absorbed, as Professor Perez alerted us to last night, when it comes to women of color feminism and Latinx intellectual and cultural productions. So that is to say, it's um, continuously and widely misread and unseen. So I want to go, I'm going to show you a very hyper-local example. I hope it will be instructive and not too boring, but it shows how Latinidad is rendered invisible again and again. 
by our institutions and our history. And although it's a local data set, this is not, I want to make it very clear, this is not an isolated or individual incident. It's a systemic problem and issue. And it perhaps relates to or informs the anecdote that Pilar Tompkins Rivas shared about the photo curator who asked, why didn't I know about Laura Aguilar's work before? Do other Latina photographers exist? So again, just want to show you how easy it is to make these things invisible. So when you're searching the Williams College Museum of Art database and you search the word Chicano, how many works of art can you find? Zero. Search Chicken X, zero. What if we do this softball pitch and search the term that the Boston Globe, unfortunately, still chooses to use in its art reviews and coverage? Hispanic, zero. Latino? Oh, here we are, wait, sorry. Hispanic, zero. I need to get on the board. Latino, one. And it's the image that was used for the catalog. I can talk about that later if you'd like, or for the catalog, for the poster. <laughs> what happens if we change the search terms? African American yields 140 results. And just to give you an example of kind of how you can see the detail of how and when right, the term comes up, um, so that it can be catalogued in that way. Let's try some others. Caribbean, zero. Cuban, zero. And yet, we have this great collection of Ana Mendieta photographs, a Cuban artist. Or, and the work of Maria Magdalena Campos Ponce is in the collection. And 17 works by Felix Gonzalez Torres in the collection, all Cuban artists. What about Puerto Rico? Oh, sorry, how many before? Puerto Rican, zero. And yet, in the collection, there are seven prints by the Puerto Rican artist Papa Colo, a pioneering interdisciplinary figure in New York's art scene since the 1970s. He co-founded the alternative art space Exit Art in New York in 1982, and in 2012, exhibited a collection of prints produced at Exit Art by artists such as Leila Ali, Orly Genger, and Elizabeth Murray. So these were all donated to Wickman in 2012. So, and here we see him, the same artist, Papa Colo, performing his iconic work, Superman 51, from 1977, that was used as a publicity image and catalog cover image for the brilliant exhibition, exhibition Arte, no es Vido, Arte No Es Vida at El Museo del Barrio, curated by Deborah Colon, now director of the Bronx Museum of Art, and with us this afternoon. We're so honored that you're here with us, Deborah. Thank you. So does it, are you beginning to, are you following this kind of mundane, <laughs> right? Search Latin America? Nada. Is it? Search South American, South America, two works. What happens when you search Europe? Oh my goodness, 451. <laughs> so again, if you're a student and you're trying to do some research, trying to find artists that you might write about for your class, you know, do the meanwhile exercise, be like, I'm gonna go in and show my professor that there is some work by Latin American and Latinx artists that I want to introduce them to. This is not gonna help you at all, right? Um, and yet, the works are there, right? So we do have works by South American artists, although Marisol is categorized only as French in this particular instance. We have work by the Chilean artist Alfredo Lujar, mentioned several times by Rocio earlier today. Right, and again, I want to go back to Chicano. Uh, so we get zero for Chicano, and yet we have works by Luis Jimenez, Enrique Chagoya. How would you ever know that Williams College Museum of Art has the largest collection of OSCOM-related materials of any museum anywhere? Right, works like For Supper, Instant Mural, works that were created as works of Chicano art and are not cataloged in that way. How would you know that we have two wonderful pieces by Patsy Valdez, a Teddy Sandoval, a Cristina Fernandez? How would you know? How does this serve undergraduate research and teaching? How does this serve curatorial research? 
And as I was just scrolling along and looking at Fernandez, when I searched Fernandez, because I knew that this was a piece that we had in the collection, because Rita and I did the studio visit with her, and then LACMA and WICMO purchased a piece simultaneously, or at the same, at the same time, um, I stumbled across this artist, who some of you may know, Benedict Fernandez. We have 12 photos by Fernandez in the collection. He's an 83-year-old artist who grew up in East Harlem with, from an Italian mother and a Puerto Rican father. He met Dr. King in 1967, and as he told the New York Times in 2014, my photographs became my protest. His photographs often portray the civil rights leader in personal, introspective, and ordinary moments. These are great photographs in our collection. And again, this is the one piece that is kind of listed as, 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 as Latino. So these are, I just want to say, the same problems. So fundamentally, I want to say some things are just simply not allowed to signify. right? Um, and we have things are cataloged and archived in such a way um, are, that don't make them useful or relevant for researchers. And one can say this writ large for the WICMA system. It's not just about cultural and racial identities. But also, I want to point out how sometimes the most practical things can inhabit uh, an entire discipline and scholarship. Um, and these are kind of exactly the same problems that I faced when charting a dissertation research over 25 years ago in the University of Rochester, right? Trying to find the records for materials on Chicano art in the existing cataloging structures. So I would say the stakes are high, and these questions about how we access things um, are, are incredibly important. And I want to just think through this as well, just for a moment, um, because I want, to, I want to think about why this is the only piece that is tagged as Latino, right? And Marco Antonio Flores was given the assignment. I was like, we have all these great works of Chicanx and Latinx artists in our collection. Let's use one. Let's highlight this collection for the poster and for the publicity images. And this is the one work that would come up. So what is it about this work? Right. This is an incredibly powerful work. Um, it's a work that I helped to bring into the collection. Um, and it was a work that is um, it, it's visually and conceptually you know, incredibly powerful. But, and I wanted it to be in the WICMA collection um, because I was interested in this work in relationship to other large-scale photo installations in the collection, including works by Ma Maria Magdalena Campos-Pons, Gilbert and George, Kiki Smith, Lorna Simpson, and Carrie Mae Weems. But is this the most visibly recognizable or identifiable image as Latino in the Williams College Museum of Art collection? Or to Williams College Museum of Art staff members or catalogers or visitors? And if so, why? Right, because of brown body in prison, right? In a way that actually, once we put the poster together, I began to have a tremendous sense of unease with this poster. Because once we get the inclusion of the text, new directions in Latinx art, it was like straight to prison. <laughs> um, so these are also, I wanted to sh these. this is the impact, right, that those kind of mundane cataloging issues around terminology can, can have. Um, so I, in, in, um, but all of this makes me think that, um, think about something that Marco Antonio Flores said in the student newspaper when talking about organizing this conference. And um, the way that he described this, organizing the conference as a meaningful cultural and intellectual project for him, but also as a personal achievement. He says, there was a moment last year after on Dean's class that it just kind of hit me how difficult it felt for me to identify as an art historian or to tell people I was an art historian. And that moment of recognition was so pivotal for me to realize that there's so much work ahead of us. And I think that's the message that I kind of want to think about as, as um, is all the work that we still have. And also to think about 
all the kind of ideas and models and kind of strategies and tactics that were shared with us today by this amazing panel and all the ideas that have been percolating through the conversations on stage and off stage that I hope we can find inspiration and guidance in moving forward with this as we kind of as we collectively chart this future direction. And you know, as I think about Adriana's question, how to render visible people and stories that dominant accounts of US history have rendered invisible. From Rocio, can we create a history of US Latinx art that still includes artists who have never and would never use the term? From Rita, how to break down the class, racial, and ethnic barriers that continue to keep the upper echelon of the museum leadership, as well as the audiences of these spaces, largely white and middle to upper class? From Pilar, how can we shift the canon of art history by centering artists of color rather than sidelining them? And from Roberto's attention to voicing and visuality of Latinx art and Ramon's attention to pleasure and movement. These are the things that I hope can guide us collectively to map out this future. In this cohort, I think you've seen the confianza, confianza conocimiento, and convivencia that you know, Dr. Tomás Ibarra Prausto and Professor um, Adriana Zavala shared with us today. This, this, this model of kinship, the networks of support and sustainability, that kind of intellectual interlocutors and co-conspirators, um, that, that ways that we've kind of, our relationships have developed over time. I also see this. I see this confianza, conocimiento, and convivencia reflected and projected into the future with the graduate students here. And in, with this, in, with, in particular, with a cohort of four graduate students that I shared a seminar with in the fall, Izzy Caso, Sosa, Will Hernandez, and Marco Antonio Flores. Will you please all stand? You are the future generations of Latinx art history. Thank you. So I think we have some wine waiting.